I'm just asking our techie person. Thank you for turning up the sound, to turn up the sound. Uh, welcome everyone to this uh, Board of Health meeting. It's a pleasure to have everyone here. We have some important items on the agenda to discuss and to uh, debate and uh, vote on. Uh, just by way of uh, <coughs> background, uh, there are five items on today's agenda. If you are coming and going and you want to know where things are at with the agenda, we have a screen at the back there uh, that uh, provides real-time updates concerning where we are in the agenda and what is coming up next. Uh, for those of you who are watching online or on television, you can follow the agenda and debate on your computer, tablet, or smartphone. You just go to www.toronto.ca forward slash council and you will be uh, plugged, uh, plugged in. And that's actually for all uh, council committees uh, that uh, meet uh, here. Um, we'll, what we usually do is we go through the agenda fairly uh, quickly. Uh, you will note, or I will, I will let you know now, that we have, uh, a, we have about uh, 35 deputants for the, after, for the afternoon. We have about 30 folks for tea, for the first item, which is the supervised injection services for Toronto next steps. If you wish to speak and you are not on the list, it is now a 105. We'll take speak, uh, anyone who still wants to put their name. We are very welcoming and you're very welcome to say what you need to say, but we'll take new names until 115, after which we're going to close the list. So you have until 115 to get your name on the agenda and you can speak to a clerk and the clerks you can speak to are right here on my, on my uh, right. Okay, so what we do first for newcomers is we first uh, go through the uh, agenda and see which item, items uh, need to be held. So 10.1, we'll hold it because we have uh, deputations. 10.1. Two, the issue is artificial trans fat, the need for federal regulations. Does anyone want to hold that? So moved by Trustee Glover, if that's okay. Number two, all in favor, opposed if any, that's carried. 10.3, we have deputations, so we will hold that for deputations. 10.4, we have, uh, the issue is Restriction of smokeless tobacco use in professional and amateur sports facilities. I note that we have two deputants there. <clears throat> I understand that uh, at least one of them, I think maybe even both of them, have severe time constraints. And because there are only two, uh, and because this is frankly at this point a report request, I'm going to entertain them first off the bat to get them uh, uh, to be able to uh, leave. Uh, so that's 10.4, and so we're going to hold that uh, for deputations. And then 10.5, access to city services for undocumented <coughs> uh, Torontonians. Okay, so we have a, a th does anyone w wish to hold that for, a, we do have a quick uh, kind of cleanup uh, motion. that was worked on. Do you want to give it a quick read? Are people okay with that motion? Feel free to hold it. Okay, so we'll, I'll uh, move the motion. All in favor, opposed if any, that's carried. Okay, so, um, <clears throat> actually I forgot a couple of steps here. Are there any declarations of interest under the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act? Seeing none, confirmation of minutes. January 25th, 2016, moved by Councillor Carmichael Greb. All in favor? Opposed if any, that's carried. Okay, so now we'll very quickly go to 10.4, restrictions on smokeless tobacco use in professional and amateur sports facilities. We have two deputants, uh, Michael Purley, Director, Ontario Campaign for Action on Tobacco, and Peter Selby, Director, Medical Education Center for Addiction and Mental Health. Are you here? Come on forward. Good 
Good afternoon. Welcome. of chewing tobacco, and then I'll talk a little bit about the context uh, of the campaign to rid Major League Baseball and other sports of chewing tobacco. Thank you. Well, thank you, and uh, thank you to the Council for uh, having us here. Hopefully you can hear me. Um, my work is mostly in treating the deadliest addiction that we know to, to date, which is tobacco addiction, and as you know, it kills approximately uh, the size of a small Ontario town every year. Uh, and Part of that is how do people actually get addicted to tobacco, and one pathway that is really of concern to me is actually happening to our young people and has, has tends to occur, which is through uh, the use of oral and chewing tobacco. And oral and chewing tobacco, as some of you may know, isn't as innocuous as we would, we would like it to be. The number one health effect of using chewing tobacco, actually, is that it addicts people, and addiction by itself is not something that we want people to get uh, to develop because it's a lifelong problem. The problem is with chewing tobacco, although it's not burnt or combusted, actually does in itself contain cancer-causing chemicals. It also contains high amounts of sugar, high amounts of salt. It actually has high amounts of potentially ammonia, as well as actually uh, abrasions that actually uh, uh, abrade or rub against or soften the lining of the mouth from which the uh, nicotine gets absorbed. So. In addition to addiction, the biggest health effect that is of, of concern, obviously, is with the kinds of chewing tobacco sold in Canada, is that its risk of developing and of causing oral cancers. And I don't know if you've ever seen anybody who's had an oral cancer, but typically the treatment is not good, because when you take that uh, cancer out, you're pretty much taking out half somebody's face, their tongue, sometimes their throat, their voice box, and, and it's really quite debilitating if it doesn't actually kill the person. So that is one of the biggest concerns from the oral cancers that, that chewing tobacco can cause. Uh, the second one, which is not very well known, but is actually a big, another big concern, is pancreatic cancer. And pancreatic cancer is a cancer that often when people are diagnosed, uh, they die within a year of that diagnosis. Most people don't make it. And most times when it's diagnosed, it's diagnosed in an advanced form. And it's a very painful cancer to have and die from. So, so from the cancer perspective, that is a huge effect from, uh, from using chewing tobacco. And, and worldwide, it is a problem uh, of oral tobacco use. Uh, in addition, the more uh, sort of less cancer-causing issues that occur, obviously, are things like precancerous lesions in the mouth, problems with tooth loss and, 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 and tooth decay and gingivitis and these other causes and oral effects of chewing tobacco. In some communities, chewing tobacco and the spitting associated with it helps promote the spread of tuberculosis, so infectious diseases like that are also uh, made worse. And then uh, roughly you have other sort of effects like because of the high sugar, people with diabetes can have you know, uh, complications from that, et cetera. So roughly that's what we know about the health effects of chewing tobacco, and clearly it is not something that we want to have uh, being promoted in, in a society such as ours, uh, primarily because of the effects on, on health. So I'll, I'll, I'll stop there and pass it on to Michael. Thanks, uh, Peter, and thank you, Mr. Chairman, for uh, accommodating our request. Um, and thank you for uh, the motion that you're going to propose uh, that uh, Toronto address this problem. Um, in the United States, uh, there is a big campaign underway uh, to rid Major League Baseball of uh, the use of chewing tobacco and smokeless tobacco. A, because of its health effects, and major players such as Tony Gwynn and Kurt Schilling are suffering, or Tony Gwynn died recently, and Kurt Schilling is under treatment for oral cancer as a result of using chewing tobacco. And they are, Mr. Schilling especially, has made this his legacy issue in baseball as a former baseball player to rid the sport. Uh, of chewing tobacco. A number of U.S. cities, uh, San Francisco, Los Angeles, Boston, and most recently New York and Chicago, uh, have taken steps at the municipal level to ban chewing tobacco use, smokeless tobacco use, in all uh, professional and amateur sports facilities. The primary target is Major League Baseball, but uh, the spillover effects are very important because, especially for us here in Canada, uh, the Blue Jays, of course, are our national team. So anything that happens in terms of the Blue Jays uh, agreeing with a policy like this and, and uh, going along with it will have huge repercussions across the country. 
Uh, also, we have major smokeless tobacco use in hockey and baseball at the amateur level in Canada. Um, in Ontario, we have about 53,000 uh, grade 7 to 12 uh, students using smokeless tobacco. In, on, in Toronto itself, the rate is lower. It's about 3% as opposed to about 6% province-wide, 3% here in Toronto. That translates to several thousand kids using this product, some in amateur baseball, many in amateur hockey. So Toronto's action in this regard to ultimately eliminate <clears throat> to, uh, smokeless tobacco use uh, in Major League Baseball, but also in other professional and amateur sports facilities will rid us of a major source of addiction and health issues as Dr. Selby's uh, outlined in Toronto, but it will have huge spillover effects for the rest of the province and the rest of the country. So thank you very much for taking this initiative. Thank you. I certainly appreciate all the work you've done over the years. Uh, Michael, uh, are there any questions of the two deputants? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Are there, uh, recognizing that this was a, a memo from uh, myself as chair, are there any uh, questions of staff on this uh, particular motion from the chair? Seeing none, are there any speakers to it? Okay, I'll speak very quickly to it. <clears throat> the motion that you have before you, what it does is it, uh, it doesn't pass any bylaws at the present time. It asks the medical officer of health to do his due diligence and to uh, basically put together a consultation process in a bylaw by year's end. Uh, so this is the beginning of the process. It's not the end of the process. Um, I look forward to that uh, report coming back. Uh, the more I've learned in the last uh, little while on uh, smokeless tobacco, the more certainly I think this is something that we should be concerned about as uh, Torontonians and as uh, Canadians, Ontarians and as people. And uh, so I look forward to that uh, report coming back and us continuing that campaign that we have started several years ago when we were at 25% smoking. We, I, certainly when I was a child, it was 50% smoking in in, uh, in Toronto, then it went down to 25, and then we did the restaurants, um, and that went down to, after we did the restaurants, it's somewhere in the teens. Um, other jurisdictions like uh, California, they're below 10%, uh, and it seems big tobacco is very smart. It's kind of like whack-a-mole. You whack them down here, and then it comes out as, uh, as um, hookah, hookah pipes. You whack them there, and then you start to see them aggressively marketing to, um, to young people through chewing and smokeless tobacco. So this is something that I think uh, <laughs> might be a multi-generational fight uh, to control uh, the uh, abuse, use and abuse of, uh, of uh, uh, tobacco. So I look forward to that report uh, coming back and for us doing the right thing. And I might say just for those of you who might even be a little bit hesitant that the Blue Jay uh, Association is totally with us uh, in this, as is Major League Baseball. They are negotiating a new contract between the players and the owners, and the hope is, is that this becomes part of the new contract uh, that will be negotiated by year's end, and it will cover all of Major League uh, sports. So I commend uh, the motion uh, to you for your uh, support. Any other comments? Okay, all in favor of the motion? Opposed, if any, that carries. That carries, okay. Okay, so we'll go on to the uh, item where we have a lot of deputants. And let, let me say uh, this, um, there are about 30 deputants. Uh, my hope is, is that it's a respectful conversation. I think for some folks, it might be the first time through it. Uh, we'll start with a presentation from the Medical Officer of Health. Uh, you will have and the rules around here, for those of you for whom this is the first time, you have five minutes to speak. At about four minutes and 30 seconds, I, I do something like this, which means wrap it up. But because there are so many deputants and because there may be a temptation to say, well, let's just cut it down to three minutes, which I don't really, I want people to have their say. I think we all wanna hear uh, people out on this. I'm gonna really be strict on the five minutes. So I'm saying that respectfully, but upfront, so that you don't get offended when I say five minutes is up. Okay, so just so you know. Uh, if you don't have a copy of the report, it's in that box 
there. And the thing that I would want you to note is we are not making a decision today around whether these sites go in or not. Today is, is us authorizing the medical officer of health to go out to the community to consult. That report is gonna come back in a few months when they are finished their cons consultation. And it's at that time that we will be making a decision as the Board of Health and then eventually City Council itself. So just so you know that the decision before us is, is to begin that process of consultation. We can nip it in the bud today or we can say, yes, we want this uh, to go forward. So you may wanna keep that in mind as you prepare your uh, comments. Okay, great, so we'll start uh, with, uh, we won't start with the deputations, we'll start with the presentation from the Medical Officer of Health, then we'll go to deputations. Dr. McEwen. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I have a brief presentation which will outline what is being proposed today <clears throat> before the board. The proposal is how we take the next steps toward offering supervised injection services in Toronto. Now, supervised injection, of course, is a form of harm reduction. Uh, harm reduction is measures that reduce the harms associated with substance use, not only for individual users, but also for their families and the communities. And it is one of the four pillars of the Toronto drug strategy, the others being enforcement, treatment, and prevention. Now, you as a Board of Health already oversee the delivery of a number of harm reduction services by Toronto Public Health. Those include the distribution of sterile needles and other safer drug use supplies. And this happens uh, at our own uh, uh, program, the works, as well as through nearly 50 agencies, which del deliver these supplies to 80 sites around the city. We supply the needles and training and facilitate the availability of these services. Uh, we also do uh, overdose prevention through the distribution of naloxone, a medication which acts as an antidote for opiate overdose. Uh, we conduct uh, testing, offer testing for in, uh, infectious diseases which are transmitted by injection drug use. We offer vaccination. We offer methadone, a form of opioid substitution treatment, and of course referral to a wide range of other services which can benefit injection drug users. So this is the existing landscape in terms of harm reduction services offered by Toronto Public Health. Supervised injection, which is one more harm reduction service, uh, our health services that provide a safer and more hygienic environment where people can inject their own pre-obtained drugs under the supervision of a nurse. In 2013, uh, I reported to the board uh, on the evidence uh, for the effectiveness of supervised injection service as an intervention. And there is a wide range of studies that have been made uh, internationally, including peer-reviewed research, which demonstrate that Supervised injection reduces deaths due to overdose, and it's not hard to see why when someone is, is uh, taking their drugs in a supervised environment where there's a medical professional available to assist, it's much, more, much less likely that they'll die of overdose. It tends to reduce the behaviors that transmit infectious diseases like HIV and hepatitis. It's been shown to increase uh, referral to detox and drug treatment services. And it also has a number of community benefits, including reducing public drug use. When someone is injecting indoors in a supervised facility, they're not injecting in an alleyway or a stairwell. It reduces publicly discarded needles. Again, when the drug user leaves the supervised injection service, they leave the needle behind. They've also been found to be cost effective in terms of uh, as an alternative to the health costs associated with injection drug use and have not been found to increase criminal activity in the areas surrounding where the service is operated. So the primary service offered uh, at a supervised injection service site is a hygienic place to inject. Uh, there's also, of course, the provision of sterile supplies, safer drug use, education, and medical or nursing supervision of the injection process. Many of the services which are offered in conjunction with SIS uh, are similar to the services which are already offered in Toronto, including by Toronto Public Health. Supervised injection is not new. Uh, it's been operating for more than 30 years and there are currently about 90 such services operating around the world, mostly in Europe, Australia, and here in Canada, uh, with two sites operating in Vancouver. More are being planned. The most advanced uh, next to Vancouver is Montreal, who are already well into the development of, uh, of their program. These programs were originally implemented to address both 
uh, health issues for the users as well as public safety, including reducing public drug use um, and, uh, and uh, the discarding of, of used needles. There are three different models which you see if you look around the world. One is a standalone service, and Insight in Vancouver is, is the Canadian example of that. There are integrated services which are part of organizations which offer a range of other health services, and there are in some places mobile services. We have some history of dealing with this issue in Toronto. The drug strategy, the Toronto drug strategy, which was adopted by City Council in 2005 with the five, four pillars that I mentioned, called for a needs assessment and feasibility study to see whether supervised injection services were the right way to go for the City of Toronto. That study was ultimately done and published in 2012 as the Toronto and Ottawa Supervised Consumption Assessment, TOSCA study, and it made a number of recommendations. It recommended that Toronto would indeed benefit from having multiple supervised injection services integrated into existing health service organizations serving people who inject drugs. Um, the, the idea of a, a model of multiple sites uh, really is, was a, a, the best fit from the point of view of the feasibility study because of the nature and distribution of drug use in the City of Toronto. It also said these programs should be evaluated once they were implemented. The Board of Health supported the implementation of this form of integrated model of supervised injection service in 2013. As we look at the landscape today, uh, there is ample evidence of the need for supervised injection here in Toronto. Over the 10-year period, 2004 to 2013, there have been a 41 percent increase in overdose deaths in this city, largely as a, reside, as a result of a rise in opioid deaths, deaths from that category of drugs which includes heroin and fentanyl. This information was presented to the board last September in a, in a report on prevention of overdoses in the city of Toronto. I've just very recently received updated information from the Ontario coroner, uh, which allows us to look at the, the trend uh, in overdose deaths continuing to 2014. And the total number of deaths in 2014 uh, is 252. So it's gone up another about 20% uh, compared to 2013. So this, the concern about increases in overdose deaths, I think, has, uh, has continued. We see a high demand for existing harm reduction services across the city. There are over 100,000 client visits to the services which are supported by Toronto Public Health, and almost 1.9 million sterile needles were distributed, again in 2015. The clients of those services exhibit the risks that supervised injection is intended to address, and that is a high proportion are hepatitis C positive, an important proportion are HIV positive, and many experience overdose. This is a graph from the September 2015 report which shows the trend uh, of increase in total overdose deaths. Now this includes overdoses of all types. Um, you can see that there's a significant upward trend. If you add the 2014 data uh, of 252 deaths in total, that represents about a 73% increase over the period since 2004. This next graph breaks down by the most frequently used type of drug, and you can see the black line represents opioid-related deaths. They clearly are the biggest proportion both of the burden of illness and also of the upward trend that we've seen over the past decade. The report before you describes um, the fact that there are three health service agencies in the city, including Toronto Public Health, who are planning to add a small-scale supervised injection service to their existing health services for people who inject drugs. The three agencies are Toronto Public Health at our site in Victoria and Dundas called The Works, the West, Queen West Central Toronto Community Health Centre at Richmond and Bathurst, and the South Riverdale Community Health Centre at Queen and Carlaw. These agencies, although they are moving forward, uh, each one to develop these uh, pro programs and services, are closely coordinating program and policy development so that there will be a coherent citywide approach to these services. So why these three locations? Each one uh, ex is in a community which experiences high rates of injection, drug use, and associated risk behaviors, including frequent injection, uh, overdose, and the risks associated with it, and public injection. Taken together, these three sites distribute about three quarters of the sterile needles which are distributed across the city. So they are already serving the majority of the population who use harm reduction services. 
all three organizations have been in the business of delivering harm reduction services to injection drug users for a long time, and they have the demonstrated capacity and skill to deliver this type of services to people who inject drugs. We have local indicators of need, which are outlined in the report, that talk about the number of client visits and needles distributed at each of the three sites. Each has a significant client group, which would benefit from, public, from a su supervised injection. About a third of the clients who, who visit these services report injecting in public, uh, in stairwells, in public washrooms, and other places. Um, about a third of them say that they have had an overdose, obviously not a fatal overdose, in the previous six months. And they say when asked that they want and would use a supervised injection service. The model which is being considered uh, by all three agencies is an integrated service model in which the supervised injection service is added to existing programs within existing program space. There would be no change to the exterior of the premises and you wouldn't know by going by the facility that there was an additional service that was being offered. The benefits of having integrated services that clients will have access to a continuum of health and harm reduction services tailored to their needs. Now we know from uh, a wide range of evidence, including the feasibility study done here in Toronto, that drug users will not travel very far to use a service like supervised injection. And that has some important implications. One is that you need multiple sites in order to reach a dispersed population of users, and that's the proposal which is before you. It also means that most of the users of this service are going to be individuals who are already clients of these three agencies. It also means that if you set up a supervised injection service, it will not attract people from across the city because users just will not travel that far in order to be able to inject. There is an example of the type of model that is being proposed in Canada, and it's not in sight in the downtown east side. It is the Dr. Peters Centre in a, a very nice neighbourhood in Vancouver. Um, this is an organization which offers a range of both day and residential services uh, for people who are drug users or otherwise have HIV. Uh, here's a picture of it, pretty nice neighborhood. If you go inside to the room where supervised injection takes place, it looks like this. There are three sort of cubicles uh, equipped with sterile supplies. And if you can just see in the mirror, there is a nursing station immediately opposite where the supervision uh, takes place. Um, this uh, centre has been operating very quietly for many, many years uh, without uh, conflict with the local neighbourhood. How will these services actually work? Well, clients will arrive with their drugs, which they've obtained themselves. Uh, there will be inside waiting rooms, so people won't be lined up on the street. They'll be assessed uh, for program eligibility and then brought into the supervised injection room where they'll be given sterile supplies and supervised during the injection process. They then move into another room called the chill-out room, uh, typically in this type of facility, for observation of any drug, uh, negative drug reactions which may occur. It also gives them an opportunity to interact with the program professional staff uh, and identify whether referral to any other services are appropriate. Now, supervised injection is legal in Canada, but it does require an exemption from the Federal Controlled Drugs and Substances Act. There is legislation that outlines the criteria which may be, must be included in an application for this exemption, uh, which includes uh, quite a lot of supporting data, detailed plans about how the facility will operate and how the services will be provided. Uh, there needs to be financial information, indications of how these services will be linked to other services for drug users, and the views of a number of key community stakeholders, like the Minister of Health, uh, the local municipality, and the police chief, need to be included, along with any strategies to address any concerns that those stakeholders may raise. Another requirement is the results of a significant community consultation, and it is that direction for the community consultation that we're seeking from the board today. The consultation is a very important part of implementation. Uh, the three agencies will each need to consult with their local communities, but the process will be closely coordinated. The plan is to uh, retain an external group to facilitate public meetings, online surveys, uh, site visits, in order to seek out, to educate and inform the local community about these services, why they're important and how they'll be delivered, and also to seek out any concerns or questions from the local community. It's also expected that this process will help identify some local community members who could be part of an ongoing advisory group to help manage the relationship between the agency offering the services and the local communities. 
My recommendation suggests that we can complete this recommendation and bring back its results to the Board of Health at the July meeting uh, for this year. Now we have to recognize that supervised injection services uh, are only one part of a spectrum of services to respond to the health harms and the community impacts of injection drug use. They will not eliminate all harmful drug use or for that matter all overdoses, but I think they are a key part of the range of solutions which are needed in the City of Toronto. And overall, with supervised injection, we will expect, expect to see improved health outcomes for injection drug users and reduced community impacts of injection drug use. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. That's the end of my remarks, and I'll be happy to answer any questions at the appropriate time. <coughs> Great. Thank you very much, <coughs> Dr. McCune. And I think the appropriate time is going to be after the deputations. So first, uh, we, we, so we have uh, our deputations. Uh, the list is now closed. Um, I'm going to ask you if you are the next speaker to try to make your way close to the front or even take one of the empty seats so that we can do this with uh, some uh, efficiency. Our first deputant is Dr. Jurgen Rem, Director, Social and Epi Epidemiological Research Department, Center for Addiction and Mental Health, followed by Amy Waugh, Staff Lawyer, HIV and AIDS Legal Clinic Ontario, followed by Susan Warden, or Varden, sorry, board member, South Riverdale Community Health Center. Uh, Dr. Rem, I hope I said that correctly. Welcome. You have five minutes. Thanks a lot. And thank you for the opportunity to address uh, the Toronto Board of Health today. As it already had been discussed, my name is Jürgen Rehm and I'm a scientist at the Centre for Addiction and Mental Health, which is the largest mental health and teaching hospital in Canada. I'm here today to offer KMH's full support for the proposed development of those free supervised injection services in Toronto. Injection drug use is a very serious individual concern, but it's also a very serious public health concern. It is associated with high rates of HIV, with hepatitis C, but also with other blood burn infections. There's also a risk for overdose, we've already heard about that, fatal and non-fatal ones, suicide, infections, traffic accidents, abscesses, as well as a number of social problems. While addiction treatment can help reduce some of those problems and some of those risks, a lot of individuals are not ready yet or able to stop injecting drugs. This is why we need public health approaches on top of the treatment. And uh, some of those uh, public health approaches they've already spoken about, the needle exchange programs, and they have been proven to enhance public health by providing access to clean needles and injection supplies to people who use drugs. However, even with those services, the most vulnerable and marginalized drug users may not have a safe and private place to use their drugs. And as a consequence, there will be public consumption and littering in parks, public washrooms and the like. And this is a problem for public health and for the environment, uh, for the community. People may also be alone and away from health services if they overdose and injure themselves while injecting drugs. This is the main reason why we see supervised injection services as another important public health approach which will reduce and can reduce the harms associated with injection drug use. Research from around the globe has shown that such services are associated with several benefits to injection drug users, including reducing the behaviors associated with HIV, and hepatitis C infections, lowering risk injection practices, reducing overdoses, and increasing referrals to treatment in other health services. Uh, part of this research was done in other countries, and I was uh, actually the lead researcher in the evaluation of the Swiss uh, trial and the Swiss uh, overall integrated uh, track policy. In addition to those reductions, 
uh, supervised injection services have shown that they do not increase crime or disorder, which was some of the main problems people had been thinking about before those places were created in the surrounding neighborhoods, and they actually do reduce other problems like public drug use and the discarded injection equipment. Basically, we, uh, what I'm saying has also been supported by the Tosca study, which has already been mentioned. And this evidence, and given the findings from this study, KMH supports the proposed development of the supervised injection service in Toronto. We are open to working with other parties uh, to play a role in the evaluation or and or to offer treatment to those in need, KMHs. So KMH recognizes and acknowledges that some Torontonians may still have concerns about supervised injection services in their neighborhoods, and we fully agree with the consultation processes of the community, which is part of this development to uh, erect uh, supervised injection services. However, we also have the belief that providing supervised injection service should be primarily informed by the empirical evidence. So in conclusion, KMH believes that as a public health approach, supervised injection services can be an important part of a comprehensive drug strategy that includes prevention, harm reduction, treatment, and law enforcement. We therefore fully support the Medical Officer of Health proposal to develop those free services. Done. Thank you very much. We appreciate your timeliness, especially. I for one. <laughs> because you're setting the pace. Are there any questions? Dr. Jorgen. In which case, we'll say thank you very much. We appreciate your... your thank you for having me. Thank you. Our next deputant is Amy Waugh, staff lawyer, HIV and AIDS Legal Clinic, Ontario. Welcome. Followed by Susan Varden and Dennis Long. Hi. Um, as the councillor has introduced me, I'm a lawyer at the HIV and AIDS Legal Clinic, Ontario, and I'm here to speak on behalf of three legal organizations which support the Medical Officer of Health's report on the implementation of supervised injection sites. These organizations include the Canadian HIV and AIDS Legal Network, uh, my clinic, the HIV and AIDS Legal Clinic of Ontario, and also the Arch Disability Law Center. First, we applaud the board for approving the implementation of SISs in Toronto, and today we urge the board to order Dr. McEwen to begin stakeholder consultations. We also urge the board to facilitate processes, build support, and obtain the opinions required to get the ministerial approval required for the implementation of the three proposed sites. Further, we hope to assist the board today by providing an overview of the relevant laws and show how they require government actors to implement services such as HIS, SISs to ameliorate the barriers to health standards and services faced by people who inject drugs. While you are no doubt familiar with the facts and statistics, I will begin by highlighting some of the most legally relevant facts and then move on to show how human rights, domestic constitutional, and international laws apply to this situation. So um, it's very clear that injection drug use is associated with important public health risks, such as HIV and hepatitis C infection and drug overdose. The, the Toronto and Ottawa Supervised Consumption Assessment Study 2012 show that people who inject drugs have high rates of HIV and hepatitis C. Um, Toronto has seen a 41% increase in overdose-related deaths in the last 10 years. It's also clear that people who inject drugs have complex social disadvantages, and including disabilities and poverty. The Supreme Court in the 2011 dis Insight decision about the first government approved SIS uh, found that, in, quote, injection drug users are a historically marginalized population that has been difficult to bring within the reach of healthcare providers, unquote. The evidence shows that SISs are an effective way of bringing health care and supports within the reach of people who inject drugs. I'm going to move on to the section about law. Um, under law, people who inject drugs have the right to equal access to health outcomes. 
Under law, government actors are required to provide programs that ameliorate the barriers faced by people who inject drugs so they can achieve positive health outcomes. Ontario public health standards, first of all, mandate that boards of health ensure that priority populations have access to harm reduction services to reduce the transmission of sexually transmitted infections and bloodborne infections, and confers on those boards a responsibility to ensure access to a variety of harm reduction program models, which shall include the provision of sterile needles and syringes, and may include other evidence-informed harm reduction strategies in response to local need. These harm reduction strategies include SISs. The Supreme Court found that the Char Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, um, as in the insight decision that I referred to earlier, and, and um, required the Federal Minister of Health in that case to reverse its decision and allow insight in Vancouver to continue to operate um, the SIS facilities. In its decision, the court recognized that, quote, insight has saved lives and improved health and did those things without increasing the incidence of drug use or crime in the surrounding area. Ontario's Human Rights Code mandates the implementation of SISs and community fear and resistance in the absence of evidence should be actively assuaged. Disability under the code includes addictions, including specifically addictions to illegal drugs. It also includes mental health conditions and other concomitant medical conditions such as HIV and hepatitis C. The code also prohibits discrimination on the ground of disability and requires public health service providers to address barriers to positive health outcomes. SISs accommodate the disability-related needs of persons who inject drugs because they mitigate risks and health inequities by providing sterile equipment, education, treatment of concomitant medical conditions, um, and supervision and emergency help. We applaud your approval of the compelling evidence that keep that SISs keep injection drug users healthier. And we now ask you to approve Mr. Uh, Dr. McEwen's report and remind you that while having to grapple with the onerous criteria under the Act, the board will have to work strenuously to address barriers facing uh, people who inject drugs. And we know, of course, that the hurdles under the Act are unjustified, discriminatory, and shouldn't be there in the first place, but no doubt during the community consultations, you will hear about the fears and perceived risks of SISs. In the next stage, you. your obligations um, under the law require that you actively address can't do that. community You can't concerns. do that, you can't do that. Okay, thank you, we appreciate that. Okay. Are there any questions of this deputant? Okay, appreciate that, sorry for cutting you off. Okay. Thank you, Amy. Next is Susan Varden, follows, followed by Dennis Long and Dr. Sarah Eckler. <clears throat> Susan, welcome. Good afternoon. Good afternoon to you. Thank you for having me here. I have my colleague Lynn Raskin beside me. She's the Chief Executive Officer of the South Riverdale Community Health Centre. In case you have questions for me that I am unable to answer. My name is Susan Varden and I'm a board member of South Riverdale Community Health Centre. I've lived in Riverdale for over 20 years and it has been a wonderful place for me to live and raise my three children who are now aged 17, 15, and 13 years old. I'm incredibly proud to be associated with South Riverdale Community Health Centre. South Riverdale does an exceptional job of providing a range of healthcare services and supports for people living in our community, and most particularly for those individuals who face poverty and are often forced to live on the margins of seemingly prosperous communities. One of the programs I'm most fond of and proud of at South Riverdale is their harm reduction program. It began in the late 1990s with a proactive needle exchange. This program, along with others like it in the city of Toronto, was a key factor in the relatively low incidence of HIV transmission from needle sharing in Toronto in the early 2000s. Um, Toronto's rate in those days was around 7% compared to 24% in other major cities across Toronto. At present, it's closer to 4%. This is something we should all be very proud of. South Riverdale seeks to decrease the social barriers to positive health outcomes for people who use illegal drugs. I have been both touched and humbled to hear from and meet the volunteers and staff associated with the program and the sense of care, dignity, and community that is so evident amongst those involved in the delivery of the harm reduction program. 
I'm here to support South Riverdale's application to become a supervised injection service for a number of reasons. Firstly, because it is a simple build on a center of excellence that is about respect, dignity, and results. I want to live in a community that is proud to stand up tall and say we will care for our fellow citizens. We are our brother's keepers, and this application to expand the range of harm reduction services for injection drug users by adding a supervised injection service to the Queen Street East location allows us to build on 20 years of experience in this field. It will also allow us to continue to save lives of those living and using illegal drugs in our community. And lastly, it will allow this organization to continue to contribute to building a safe and healthy community in South Riverdale. Thank you for taking the time, uh, take, giving me the opportunity to speak with you today, and I do hope you will support the um, proposal in front of you for the community consultations. Great. Do you have any Thank questions? You. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? Visiting councillors first, Councillor Fletcher. Thank you. Nice to see you here today. I just have a few questions about um, the community consultations that you're planning to hold. Uh, for the site. Can you just tell me a little bit about that, please? I'll let the board know. All I can say is that there's about five and they're on Thursday evenings, but Lynn will have more detail. So the, the, current, oops. the current plan is for us to run a series of open houses on uh, six Thursdays from uh, the beginning of April to the middle of March. Uh, sorry, in the middle of May, and in addition to doing a broader community consultations, then evaluating what we haven't, who we haven't reached, and continue to do this up until uh, the July meeting. Uh, thanks. And will you consider going out into the community, such as to a BIA meeting or parent council? They wouldn't have to come to the center, but you'd do that kind of outreach as part of the consultation? It's already planned, Paula. Ooh, good for you. Um, and the Medical Officer of Health, this motion actually directs the Medical Officer of Health to be part of this consultation, should the board agree to that or direct him. Would you consider having the Medical Officer of Health um, participate in some way in some of the local consultations? There's an email waiting for him. <laughs> an email <laughs> waiting for him. Yes, we, we uh, intend to do that to bring people into the open houses and the consultations generally that can speak to this issue from beyond the South Riverdale and look at this as a, an issue that is not only cross Toronto but a national and international issue. And can I just ask how you're planning to track or report on the results of the consultation locally? I heard about uh, a website or Toronto Public Health doing that, but how would you anticipate doing that locally, Lynn? Uh, in a couple of different ways. One is to actually have people register, everybody that comes into the consultation so that we have both uh, who, the who and the numbers. And secondly, to actually invite people from the community to continue to uh, participate that have uh, come into the center for various other reasons. In, um, in addition, because we're going to try to locate those that were missing. Uh, it will be a, a continual process of trying to do some outreach to groups that we don't know about. So it's, um, it's a rather iterative process that we plan, both with some very concrete pieces and, and the, uh, the other part is just keeping it open to addressing issues as they come forward and concerns. And I just wanted to ask Susan, I assume that your board is 100% behind this initiative. Unanimously and all very eager to participate in the consultations. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Fletcher. Any other questions? I have a quick question for you, for you uh, Susan, as uh, someone who lives in the South Riverdale community, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. So uh, I think the stumbling block for many is the call it in my backyard. So they might be supportive of the issue overall. I'm wondering what arguments will you use or how, what approach will you take on a neighbor to neighbor basis to help that dialogue happen? Um, how do you do it? <laughs> it's a good question and I don't wanna get self-righteous with my neighbors, uh, but I also feel like we have a moral responsibility in our community to care for everybody, no matter their choices. And I think uh, as I have been able to become more and more involved in South Riverdale and see how they're engaging um, users and past users in the program, 
Uh, we are working with a population that deserves care as much as the next person. And I, th I look forward to the conversations in my own community, which I will be having with uh, individuals who may be less uh, aware or exposed to, you know, who are the real people that are using these programs and why they deserve to get the same level of care that I get, that my children get, that my mother gets. Um, I think most people living in our community, you would like to think, uh, see us all as equal. And if they don't, I'll look forward to speaking with them to try and change their mind. Do you think that uh, actually visiting this site is an important part of it as well? I, I will encourage people, I will talk to people and encourage them to come to the community consultations because I think um, just like the picture that we saw of the site in Vancouver, the South Riverdale Community Health Centre looks like any other building on in Queen Street and uh, one would never know that there's already a very active and successful harm reduction program by just going by it. And I think going in and hearing a little bit about the types of services and clientele that they are working with so far and seeing what it is and it's not, you know, a room of 35 stations, it's a room of three stations um, that gives people exactly what it says, a supervised injection service um, so that it can be safe and indoors uh, just makes sense on a lot of reasons. So I think, yes, visit, have, encouraging people to go to the site and learn more about the centre is an important piece. Great. Thank you very much for your helpful answer. Okay. Thank you. Seeing no, no other questions, our next deputant is Dennis Long. Breakaway Addiction Services, <coughs> followed by Dr. Sarah Eckler and Ellis Ziegler. Good Welcome. afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you for this opportunity. I am Dennis Long. I'm the Executive Director of Breakaway Addiction Services in Parkdale of the City of Toronto. I'm also a member of the uh, uh, Drug uh, Strategy Implementation Panel. Um, I wanted to talk the first question that came to my mind when I was thinking about it is, uh, what took you so long? Um, and I know the answer to that, but here's where I'm coming from. I operate, we operate a methadone service for about 120 some odd people. In the last few years, we've seen the rate of overdoses amongst the associates and our clients, associates of our clients and our clients increased about threefold which is not a lot of people, it's about three or so a year, but we know all these people and we care about them. And when they die, it's a tragedy. And the recovery path that they may have chosen or are about to choose is no longer available to them. And in many cases, they're somebody's wife, somebody's mother, somebody's father, um, somebody's friend. And that, to me, is a tragedy. This should have happened a long time ago. We're not going to solve all the problems of overdose with this service, that's clear. But one of the things we are experiencing right now, as I just explained, is a rather slow moving crisis in injection drug use in this city and opiate drug use in this city. And it's driven by a number of factors. One was the change in the demographics of drug users, which was in large part because of the incursion of prescription drugs. So now we're seeing people uh, younger age range, significantly younger age range, um, presenting with uh, opiate addiction or opiate dependence problems. Um, people in their late teens, early 20s, mid 20s, when before it used to be people in their 30s. We're seeing people um, from all aspects of society. We always did, but now it's, it's becoming more of a middle class phenomenon than it ever was before. We're also seeing a change in patterns. The somewhat misguided reformulation of OxyContin um, has driven people to use different kinds of drugs. In many cases, drugs they're not familiar with, such as heroin, such as hydromorphone, uh, such as fentanyl drugs with a greater potential to cause overdose, and particularly in naive hands where they don't know what they're doing and they don't understand the phenomena of street drugs and often drugs of re remarkably unreliable potency from one dose to another. So we're seeing an increase in deaths and that needs to be addressed. This service will save lives and there's no question about it. And I think 
what I've been struck with, and I've been working on this for some time now and just in the last few weeks, since the announcement of this service being developed, what is, some years ago, um, three, uh, three or four years ago to be exact, um, I opened our methadone clinic in a, uh, or I moved our methadone clinic to a residential neighborhood in Parkdale. To say we were um, greeted with open arms would be wrong. Uh, we were gr greeted with open hostility amongst the neighbors. We had a lot of fear, a lot of concerns, the same kind of concerns that we hear over and over again. My property values are gonna go down. My children will be at risk and so on. Um, and since that time, we have now become good neighbors and we have very good relationship with our neighbors. But what struck me about this is we announced this in the neighborhoods and I'm not hearing people screaming. I'm not hearing people coming up and saying, don't you dare put that in my neighborhood. What I'm hearing, and we just heard, is people from the neighborhood saying, yeah, open it up, this is good for us. Now, part of that is, I think, concern for the users, and the other is part is concern for the community because if people are, shooting, are not shooting up in a safe supervised injection site, where are they gonna be shooting up? They're gonna be shooting up in alleyways, McDonald's washrooms, library washrooms. It's happening now and then they're discarding their works, yep, and, they're, and there's a problem. I am encouraged by the fact that neighborhoods are embracing this idea and I urge the board to move quickly. Thank you. Thank you very much for your comments. We have a question from Councillor Doucette. Thank you very much. Do you think people aren't coming out in force against this because there's already a site at each of these locations which are already helping people by giving them clean needles, mm -hmm. by having a nurse there, because do you feel that because those sites are already there, we're already helping people, maybe a shoulder to or someone to talk to if they're wanting to get off drugs, whereas when you opened up your clinic, you were coming in kind of fresh <laughs> to a new neighborhood? Yeah. Yeah, so, I, I think that's a significant part of it, and I think the other um, issue that I think needs to be addressed as we move forward, and, and, um, as the previous presenters were saying, is that these services will probably be, the large majority of people who use these services are people already going to that facility for other reasons and other services. Um, so the demographics of the people moving into the in and out of the center will be more or less similar. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for doing your methadone clinic. Well, thank you. Thank you, seeing no other questions. Thank you very much, uh, Dennis, appreciate your comments. We have uh, Dr. Sarah Eckler replacing Steve Barnes and later on, Steve Barnes will replace Sarah Eckler. <laughs> Welcome. Hi, I'm uh, Dr. Sarah Eckler. I'm a family doctor working at Queen West Community Health Center. And uh, my executive director and boss, Angela Robertson, is here to answer any questions that, uh, <laughs> if any should arise, that I'm uh, not able to answer completely. So I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to speak to the board today. Um, and I, I think, um, you know, basically where I'm coming from is I've been working at Queen West Community Health Center and other CHCs for the last 10 years. And during this time, I've done quite a bit of outreach work. And on that outreach work, I've had the opportunity to witness the types of conditions in which my patients are using and injecting drugs. And it's been very eye-opening for me. So I've been in dark rooms where there have been needles and syringes strewn all over the furniture and the beds um, with half-eaten food and garbage everywhere and containers filled with liquids that I couldn't identify. Um, and I've been in the alleyways and walked through them where people inject drug behind, drugs behind dumpsters. And this, these types of experiences have really opened my eyes and helped me to understand the harm that happens uh, to people because of the way that they're injecting drugs and the conditions in which they're injecting drugs above and beyond the actual harm of the substance, which is already significant. So, you know, when I'm in my office, my clean sterile office, and I'm seeing people with skin infections and abscesses, um, HIV and hepatitis C, as well as endocarditis, these infections and these problems are originating in the dark rooms that I did my outreach in and in the alleyways that I walk through. And so it's really brought home to me that it would be very, very beneficial for my patients to be able to have access to a supervised injection service that's embedded within our community health center, like the one that's being suggested, uh, because it will give them access to a, a safer environment in which to inject uh, education services, 
in terms of um, how to inject more safely and also uh, to reduce overdoses. Um, but not only that, it gives them access to a whole host of services and medical services and social services which they might not otherwise access. And if I've learned one thing in all the time that I've been doing work with marginalized individuals, it is that you know, you need to meet them where they're at. And so if where they're at is injecting drugs, you need to meet them there and offer them the services there. And they're more likely to accept those services, engage, um, and, and, you know, more likely to start looking after their health than if, if you try to just, you know, have a clinic and tell them to come in and see the doctor, because that's not the way it works. You have to meet people where they're at. Um, but you know, it's not just my experience, and it's not just um, what I've witnessed that tells me that the supervised injection service is the way to go. There's lots of evidence, and it's already been quoted, but I'll just remind you, lots of evidence from Canada and abroad that supervised injection services are good for people and they're good for communities. So we know that supervised injection services decrease rates of overdose and overdose deaths. They decrease risk factors associated with hepatitis C and HIV. They improve access, they increase the chance that people are gonna access health and social services and addiction services. They decrease publicly discarded needles and they are cost effective. So it, really it's a no brainer. And um, I hope that you'll, uh, I, I'm very happy that, that the board is proceeding with this and I, I, I hope that you'll continue um, forward with the supervised injection services because it's, it's simply uh, the right thing to do. Great, thank you very much. We have a minute. Oh, well, I'm done. Okay, you're done. That's all I got. Thank you. Are there any questions? I have a quick question. Sure. Um, I imagine there's an inner city kind of um, forum or group of uh, clinicians that work with uh, inner city folk. Is that the is is there one? Uh, not not a formal one. A formal I mean, one. maybe but you know who each other. Are. Yeah, we know. Yeah, 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 yeah. Is there anyone who disagrees with you on the clinician side of things? Um, you know, I'd have to say, um, I think that most clinicians are in agreement with the supervised injection services, and um, yeah, the ones I've talked to are all in agreement, yeah, with, because, because we do the work and we see the harm that comes from injection drug use and, and the way in which drugs are injected, and um, once you've seen that, it's, it's uh, you know, it's, it's pretty easy to see that this, this supervised injection service is gonna decrease suffering and decrease health problems and improve outcomes, so, yeah. Okay, great, thank you. Thank you very much, appreciate your comments. Next is Ellis Ziegler, Toronto Drop-In Network, followed by Donna May, and then Dr. Doris uh, Grinspoon. Good afternoon. To you, I'll apologize now, I have to read um, off this. Okay. Um, thank you members of the Board of Health for allowing me to speak to this item. I represent more than 50 drop-ins throughout the City of Toronto, which provide essential services to some of the most vulnerable residents of our city. These drop-ins and many other these residents are subject matter experts on many topics which affect them, including income, poverty, homelessness and health. Harm reduction is not another such issue. I'm speaking today in support of the fastest route possible to implement the three supervised injection sites proposed. This deputation is about the need for Toronto to make real the equity it seeks to claim for Torontonians and why there's no alternative but to implement the sites. There should be no question as to if, just how soon. Drop-ins in Toronto, much like shelters, are the most critical responses to our social safety net. People who attend drop-ins represent all demographics youth, singles, couples, seniors, newcomers, people with disabilities, and more. People who go to drop-ins are often living in the street or in precarious housing. Sometimes their housing doesn't provide the ability to cook meals, or the housing they found is based on their income, based on their income, isn't a safe place to be. Other people are isolated and have few support networks. As a result, in addition to meals, a safe place to be and access to services and supports, drop-ins provide harm reduction supports. Almost all of the TDIN member drop-ins provide some level of support, including safe use supplies and education, harm reduction staff, and overdose prevention interventions. Significant portions of the people who use drop-ins use substances which are illicit and injectable, sometimes in combination with other substances like alcohol, which is not illicit. So why do drop-ins provide harm reduction services? They do so to save lives and work toward supporting participants to improve their quality of life. Unfortunately, the judgment and shame experienced by participants because they're poor, homeless, survivors of trauma, and people who consume non-legal substances 
result in denial of health care and other services, including some clean supplies and safe places to be. I would propose there is no reason not to have supervised injection sites unless we continue, choose to continue to risk people's lives and community well-being or because we will continue to deem people who, who inject drugs as less worthy as human beings. I'm pretty sure neither the Board of Health nor City Council choose those decisions. So what reasons would there be? Toronto is aiming to improve equity. Moral high ground of substance use is no longer acceptable and only contributes to the problem. Legally available substances like alcohol and prescription drugs play an even greater role in potential risks behind the wheel in our communities and in homes in our neighbourhoods. The hypocrisy denies people health care, income and housing they need to stabilize their lives. Shame and labelling causes deaths. Toronto needs to be past that. Toronto wants to help save money. The average cost of an ICU bed in Canada is recently cited as almost $3,000 per day. If this, this is just for the hospital bed cost for someone experiencing an overdose or adverse reaction to consumed substances. If you add the cost of tax dollars required for police, paramedics, social service agencies to attend this health crisis just for one incident, it's even higher. If you incorporate long-term health costs of HIV and hepatitis C transmission, the cost of ignorance is untenable. Toronto wants to save lives. In 2015, over 200 people died from unintended substance use effects. Over 45 homeless people died in shelters. Over 40 deaths were counted by the homeless memorial. Poor, crazy, homeless and addicted are labels used to identify the people we see who use illicit substances. Shame and inequity only compound the risks which lead to death. Inequity kills. Toronto's own poverty reduction strategy articulates the understanding that creating equity makes our whole city healthier and safer. Substance use happens everywhere, all the time. It doesn't matter who the person is, where they live, or what substances they use. Toronto needs to end the hypocrisy. Pick a question, SIS is the right answer. It not only recognizes effective and evidence-based international best practice, but Toronto has been leading the way in harm reduction for years. SIS brings people in from the cold and dark and city playgrounds. It saves ta tax dollars in health and policing. And most importantly, it keeps Torontonians safer. They're the most important tool, along with community agencies, to smooth the path to access to increase harm reduction goals. Toronto also wants to strengthen communities. The pr proposed sites are not new freestanding sites, but part of a long-standing community health programs, which, like drop-ins, are part of the fabric of neighbourhoods across the city and committed to the wellness of everyone who lives in them. These community-based programs and agencies, along with so many others, including drop-ins, are vital social service services Toronto neighbourhoods cannot do without. I urge the Board of Health to adopt the recommendations and pursue the consultation process and in the future strongly recommend City Council uh, the means by which the three supervised infection injection sites become operational in the shortest period of time. Thank you for Thank considering you. this deputation. Thank you. Right on five minutes. We appreciate your comments. Thank Any questions? Okay, seeing none. Donna May. Moms DU, Moms United and mandated to save the lives of drug users. Hi. Welcome Donna. Thank you. Good afternoon everyone. I've spoken here before in favour of safe injection sites so I'm going to um, just provide a brief background of my story and get right to why having supervised consumption services open in Toronto and actually right across Canada is so important to me. Today marks the 43rd month since my daughter Jack died. She was an opiate addict, lived on the streets for a number of years, and did what she had to do in order to survive. As an addict, she was ostracized by her partner, her children, her siblings, her community, and by her mother. Most people would think that the hardest thing that I've ever had to face was, the, was her death, the death of my child the death of my only girl. However, that is not it at all. The hardest thing I've ever had to face in life was realizing my own ignorance towards my daughter's addiction and that it cost me years with her that I will never get back. There are no do-overs when your child is dead. Now I can only share my experience and what I've learned since so that other parents can take that away and get something with, from it. I define my ignorance this way. I lacked awareness, experience with, and knowledge about the behavior of addiction and those who are in it. 
Worse than that, though, I wouldn't allow myself to be taught or made aware. Like many others, my opinion was set in stone, and learning anything else but what I believed wasn't an option. I was fortunate, though. I was one of the lucky parents who near the end got to be by the side of my daughter before she died. I sat with her while she fought off deadly infections, withdrawal from opiates, and the shame and the stigma thrown at her by those who, like me, thought that they knew everything they needed to know about addiction. I was the lucky parent because I was blessed with a daughter who was brave enough to stand up to her mother and teach her the realities of what it is like to be an addict in an active addiction. Most parents simply get the call that it's too late, their child has died. I do understand how fortunate I am. And for that reason, I continue to advocate in my daughter's name in order to ensure that others in addiction and their families and their loved ones are educated on those realities. I do it so that the lives are not needlessly lost and so that other mothers and fathers do not have to endure the fate that my daughter and myself have. In the 43 months since my daughter left me, I have learned, and you're going, this is a repetition of what my colleagues have already said, um, that no one wakes up in the morning and decides that that day will be the day that they're going to become an addict. But they do wake up wanting to self-medicate for emotional and physical pain. I've learned that psychiatric diagnosis and treatment for those of us who can afford it and for those of us who can navigate the system of health care is difficult at best, let alone being someone who isn't capable of maneuvering it. I don't know, I don't know how we can expect someone in active use to be able to find their way to psychiatric help with, without someone to advocate for them. The opportunity to connect to mental health care can be addressed through supervised injection services. I have learned that effective withdrawal treatment specific to injection drug use is largely misunderstood. Yet we continue to wonder why those who use substances don't just detox their way out of it. How can we ask that someone who how can we ask that of someone when we are, have no understanding of what withdrawal from an opiate use does to someone's mind and body? Supervised injection services can provide sub substance users with the opportunity to connect to opiate-specific withdrawal. Already? Oh my goodness. <laughs> like I said, I had a lot that everybody else has already said, so let me go to the end. I have learned that it, it can be anyone's child who misuses a substance. Addiction does not discriminate between the rich and the poor, the unknown and the famous, the color of your skin or the amount of education you receive. It is, however, apparent that it happens in those who feel that they have nothing left to live for. Could it be that they feel that way because we have taken their self-worth away? How can we expect anything different from them if we are so unwilling to see anything different in them? There is always hope for recovery from problematic use, substance use, unless, like my daughter, they are dead. But just how much is saving a life of a substance user worth to us? For 43 months to the day, I can tell you that there hasn't been a morning that I haven't woken up answering that very question. My daughter's life was worth more than what we afforded her. In closing, let me say that I know supervised injection services will not only provide safe and sanitary conditions to inject drugs in and promote safety within the community, but it will provide a, human, a humane and human connection that is all too often lacking in the substance to user's life. Thank you. Thank you very much, Donna. We appreciate your courage in coming to speak. Are there any questions? I have a, I have a question. Um, so before you, in the time that you say were not supportive of your daughter, um, perhaps intellectually stuck, and then you moved into a different place, can you just talk very briefly to that process, because there are many in our community that are going to come after us, 
are already coming after us, it's urging us not to do this, not to condone an activity that is quote unquote wrong. And I was one of those naysayers. That's right. So you went through that process. I did. What insights can you give us to help others go through that process or that you found helpful in an approach that we could use perhaps? My daughter asked me to walk in her shoes and to look through her eyes, to see addiction from her point of view. She had a mental health uh, issue that went undiagnosed and she found that when she, she was prescribed Oxycontin and she used it, that it took care of the social, um, um, the social, social issues that she had. Um, when she addressed this with the doctor, the doctor said, that's not the meaning of why I gave you these pills. I gave them to you for a fall down a flight of stairs onto a concrete floor. You're misusing them. I'm taking them away from you. Now, she's got something that's helping a psychiatric condition. The doctor's taking it away from her, and all she wants to do is feel normal. She gets onto street drugs, finding that they're working in the same way that the OxyContin was working. And then she has to do all kinds of things in order to get them. And I mean all kinds of things. Nothing that a mother even wants to even dream of. But she has to do it in order to get the drugs that she needs. It doesn't make sense to me. It do, it, not at all. That, that is what my daughter wanted me to understand. She didn't want to be a prostitute. She didn't want to uh, inject drugs on the street. She didn't want to steal from the community and from her family. She just wanted to be normal. That's the problem that we didn't address. And the more that we didn't address it, the further down the, the road she got and out of our hands. Thank you very much. Peter has a question. Donna, thank you for your deputation. Uh, my question is, is acceptability of, of, of um, injection sites, how acceptable are they to the, uh, the drug users? And will it be acceptable and, and will, they, uh, will they embrace it? That, that's a very good point. Um, would my daughter have used such a site? Yes, I do believe she would. And we did talk about that. She did um, find services in her community that she used quite often, um, uh, to, um, the needle exchange program, the condom program, um, the womb care and things like that. Um, she, she wanted that connection. She sought out that connection. Remember, this is a girl who was ostracized by her entire family and her community and had nowhere to go. Nobody wants to be that unimportant in society. Okay, thank you very much, Peter. Thank you once again, Donna, for your uh, contribution here. Next, we have Dr. Doris uh, Greenspan, Chief Executive Officer, Registered Nurses Association of Ontario, followed by Peter Leslie. So, Hi. I have a presentation that I'm not going to read. Because how can you read after you hear the mother of someone that died to addictions, and after we heard the latest numbers, 252, that are either our brothers, sisters, sons, daughters. And when we know all the science, and Dr. McEwen, you have been eloquent for many years on this, and when we know that we have the support. So let me start with your question that you had how many would support me in saying that registered nurses, yes. nurse practitioners, and nursing students are fully behind you? And let me read your tweet that I just got before I sat here and after I heard Ms. May. So, at Doris Greenspoon, at Areneo, at Toronto, Ontario Public Health, thank you for advocating your members are with you fully for SIS, safe injection, site, safe injection sites, save lives, the time is now. This is Amanda Dodge, a fourth year student at Western University. And this is the case since we fought to keep Insight open, which Areneo 
form a coalition with the BC nurses and with the Canadian Nurses Association, and thankfully we won on that. But my question is to you, rather than you to me. How many more lives do we need to lose until something will be done? And how long do these consultations need to be, given that the evidence is there, the science is there, the people are there, and everybody's saying the time to move is now? So I ask you, Mr. Mah Mahirwick, and I ask you, Dr. McEwen, and I ask you, Councillor Cressy, what do we need to do to ensure we move fast? Because we cannot keep losing more lives needlessly in this beautiful city, or for that matter, in this beautiful province and in this country of ours. We just can't. I, for once, cannot bear listening to more mothers or fathers for that matter, or sisters or brothers. So tell us what else we need to do. At this point, your comment, your question is rhetorical. <laughs> I, <laughs> right now, I'm not, a, I, and I set the rules, I'm not allowed to speak. We'll speak at the end, and I'm sure Councillor Cressy will answer that, and I will, and maybe other members of the Board of Health will, will do our best to answer that as well. So I, I'm just if you needed you any more evidence, given that I have a couple of minutes, you have it. It's all in these <laughs> files that we gave you. We can bring more people but the time to move is now. Right. We need to keep the leadership that you're showing life and move forward because you ask, you ask another person how many will not support us. I can tell you how many nurses will not support this. Likely 2%. 2%. You know what? When we talk about some other things, there is a 2%. Sometimes there is a 15%. So yes, why don't we give needles to people with diabetes? And the answer is yes, we should. But this is about saving lives of people that are dying lonely, alone, as if they were not people. And these are just people like you, me, or anybody else. This is just, could be tomorrow your sister, could be tomorrow your brother, and let me tell you, I know people in my own family that could have ended up the same way. So we got to take really action and move sooner rather than later. We can't afford 20 more percent, 20 more percent every year higher numbers. Thank you very much. We appreciate uh, your comments. Um, any questions of the deputant? Okay, seeing none, we'll move on. There is one here. Oh, there is one here? Okay, Councillor Fletcher. No, I was just waving. You were waving. Oh, okay. sorry. Wait, she's with <laughs> Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. We appreciate your comments, uh, Dr. Greenspun. It's, uh, they're always very helpful when you come to the Board of Health. Um, folks, um, we have a little problem. We're probably going to lose quorum at around 4 o'clock. It's 2.25 2 now. And so I feel like a, um, almost anti-democratic, but I'm gonna really try to ask you to stick to three minutes. Please try to stick to three minutes. I'll give a signal at three minutes. Otherwise, we're gonna kind of lose it. And I think, given the tone of this room, we don't wanna do that. So um, please excuse my rudeness if I kind of give you a little signal at, uh, at uh, three minutes. Next is uh, Peter Leslie, Queen West. Peter. Thank you. First time I've been called three minute man, but uh, well, okay. <laughs> all other context here. <laughs> Thank you. Um, hello and good afternoon. You know, somebody's got some interesting reading on the streetcar this morning. My hard copy left was on the, was on the Carlton car, so. Okay, uh, here we go. Uh, Hello and good afternoon, committee members, councillors, and of course, city staffers present. Without you people in the ranks, this would all not be all possible. I'm here today representing the Board of Directors from Queen West Central Toronto CHC. I've been on the board for the past six years, following two years of working with Queen West on the harm reduction outreach team, and the final year in the needle exchange on site within the health center itself. I also need to state I'm a local community member, a resident of Parkdale, 
just west of Queen West catchment area and down at the uh, West Toronto there. I'm very proud and humbled that Angela Robertson, our executive director, asked me here today. Is a task, uh, task I'm honoured to fulfil. Our board consists of health, health admin people, administration people, legal minds, educators, program coordinators, and others, but all are committed to our CHC community. And of course, um, this proposal. It's pretty unanimous. I also have to add that I'm really pleased to see so many familiar faces and thank several of you for making last week's media frenzy a little more comfortable. I was thinking all week about how I was going to express my thoughts on this critical issue. Honestly, what more can be said on this? For many of us in our community health and harm reduction sec sector, SIS services as part of a comprehensive harm reduction program are a no-brainer, as been mentioned earlier. Um, the evidence at this point is, is pretty overwhelming. We at Queen West ha have been ready to roll for a while now. If nothing else, the decade of darkness under Harper regime has allowed us and others to be well prepared. That all said, I'm also aware that some people are worried about all this and it is our duty to inform and reassure this part of the community. We at Queen West are having a weekly open house on Wednesday nights all through April to address these concerns. We are, however, buoyed by such local support by business owners such as David, and I forget his last name, the owner of the Loft Hair Salon around the corner. I'm, I'm hoping his business picks up. I'm going to uh, see what I can do about that. Um, I'd also like to mention uh, Lorraine Barnaby, who's here today, uh, along with uh, some other, uh, the others, the other staff members from our harm reduction team at Queen West, for their thorough research and determined work on this issue. Today's meeting marks the culmination of years of patient work on behalf of our larger community. So now at this point, I'd like to attempt to explain and possibly put in context why I'm here and perhaps not someone more qualified, and I truly mean that. Ten years Peter, ago, I was three homeless. Minutes. It's three minutes. We done? Okay. Uh, okay, so we'll just... There'll be another opportunity. Yeah, um, I'll just say that uh, we as Queen West strive to care for all others, especially those in greatest need. And some of my, my best friends are injection drug users. I just said that. Don't thank you very much, Peter. Okay. David. okay. Seeing no questions, thank you, Angela, as well. Right. Thank you, Peter, for your ongoing work on this. I've okay. seen you so many times. Uh, Butch Silver, Drug Toronto Drug Users Union, followed by Natalie Calio, uh, Toronto Harm Reduction Alliance. Butch Silver. Welcome, Butch. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Butch Silver. I'm here today on behalf of the Toronto Drug User Union. The Toronto Drug User Union has a membership of over 80 current and former drug users. Uh, we're one of hundreds of drug user groups around the world advocating for our own human rights. Uh, we are a member of the Canadian Association for People Who Use Drugs, a coalition of over 30 drug user groups here in Canada. Uh, drug User Union was formed in November 2008 and is actively involved with many networks and coalitions, <coughs> excuse me, as well as with the Toronto Drug Strategy Implementation Panel. <coughs> we believe firmly in nothing about us without us. Uh, we are here today because we support the establishment of supervised injection services in our city as people who use drugs and who live in fear of criminalization and stigma every day. <clears throat> These spaces will be vital uh, places of non-judgment and compassion and safety. We know that there are many people who inject drugs in our city who are using in safe spaces, alleyways and washrooms, the sites selected are ones uh, where people who use drugs feel connected to and supported. Uh, these sites are comprehensive harm reduction services and adding supervised injection services will be a large benefit to people who inject drugs. Uh, having a formal space to use safely without fear of death, HIV or Hep C uh, infection or incarceration is a huge step for this city and one we fully support. Overdose deaths are painful and sudden. Myself and many other members of Toronto Drug User Union uh, know all too well the profound pain and of that loss. Uh, we have also been the people who have found people who have overdosed and died. Uh, our lives are not disposable. Uh, and we are dying at an alarming rate. Drug overdose is a significant public health issue in Toronto. 
between 2004 and 2013, there was a 41% increase in the reported number of dying, uh, people dying from overdose in Toronto. <coughs> we lack uh, the up-to-date information, but we know that it has increased as the losses have kept mounting and our pain and grief with it too. Uh, with regard to public consultations, we support them, but we want to make sure that the voices of people most impacted by overdose and marginalization uh, because of drug use are central to the consultations. Uh, we ask that these conversations remain respectful and they don't further lead to stigma and shame of people who use drugs, especially people who inject them. We want to make sure that these consultations do not become hateful and to denounce them if and when they do. Uh, we are deeply concerned with the well-being of people who inject drugs and discrimination they already face in their daily lives. Sadly, it is socially acceptable uh, to fling hatred towards people who inject drugs. We specifically ask that there is a level of decorum followed by those who have been elected as representatives abide by anti-discrimination practices, which should include people who use drugs. Supervised injection services will save people's lives, but hate, discrimination, shame is also what kills people who use drugs. Uh, however, we want to, to wrap acknowledge... It up, Butch. Just, just try to wrap it up. Okay. The outpouring of support, uh, supervised injection services, and the kindness and respect people are showing to people who use drugs. We are deeply reassuring... Uh, that there is such a broad outpouring of support. We hope this level of kindness and respect continues, and we want to thank those people who are here today to supporting the lives of people who inject drugs and who value them. Um, can we have a moment of silence uh, for the people we've lost to this uh, war on drugs? Just a quick moment. I'm sure we could do that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Butch. Any questions? <coughs> Natalie? Any comments? Oh, okay. Natalie Khalil. Welcome. It's Kellyo. <laughs> Sorry, my apologies. No, that's okay. Everyone does it. Kellyo? Kellyo. Thank you. So I'm here today. I am, as many people know me, um, the harm reduction coordinator at Parkdale Community Health Centre, but I'm here representing the Toronto Harm Reduction Alliance. We just, we fully support the Medical Officer of Health's recommendations to the Board of Health and offer our full support for, it, for this entire endeavour. THRA takes a pragmatic, evidence-based, non-judgmental approach to drugs, drug use and users and is committed to reducing the harms associated with substance use from provision of safe supplies and education on safer drug use to advocacy around genuine involvement of people who use drugs in the policies that affect them and ending the drug war. Thraw maintains that the greatest harms to people who use drugs are attributable to the war on drugs, criminalization and enforcement, stigma and discrimination, social determinants of health, poverty, homelessness, and not necessarily the drugs themselves. That said, as long as drugs are illegal, the supply, potency, and purity of drugs will remain unstable, unstable and unpredictable, thereby increasing the risk of disease, overdose, and death. The war on drugs is a colossal failure, responsible for wasting trillions of dollars while supply and demand for potency of and availability of and access to drugs have increased. The evidence supporting harm reduction programs in general and safe injection sites in particular has been expounded upon here, um, so I do not need to reiterate it. I do offer Thra's support and the expertise of our membership, um, people who use drugs, frontline workers, people involved in policy around harm reduction, and we would like to help with the consultation process in any way that we can. Um, to ensure that the voices of people who use drugs are included in what is termed the community. Because sometimes when community consultations happen, 
our, our, our membership is excluded, and we want to ensure that that doesn't happen from the support here today. I don't think that that's going to be an issue, but I want to keep us in the forefront. Um, the plan before the Board of Health today is a made-for-Toronto approach. These are busy harm reduction sites that are already have the trust of the, the um, community that they're serving. Um, and it's not, it's not going to, like, they are the places that Toronto is, is not like Insight where, sorry. Toronto is not Vancouver, and so we are very community-based, and having these in these three sites is absolutely fabulous and totally understands Toronto. Um, if you could wrap it, really up with fast. Your, wrap it up with your big final point. <laughs> oh, God. Um, overdose deaths is our, uh, one of our biggest concerns, and all I can say is we have lost tons of people that we really love and care about in our communities in the last year. Overdose numbers are going up. The unpredictability of the drug supply is like all over the map right now, and we support this as one more tool in saving lives and helping people be safe. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much, Natalie. We appreciate your comments. Any questions? Oh. None. We'll go on to Dr. Philip Berger, medical doctor, inner city health program, and associate professor, faculty of medicine, University of Toronto. Followed by Julia Chow, Director of Mental Health, Addictions and Development Services, Community Care, Wood Green. Followed by Leslie Middow. Okay. Welcome. Thank you. Good afternoon and thank you for the chance to speak to you today. I've been in front of this board twice before in 1989 and 1990 in regard to HIV prevention. And it is HIV prevention that brings me back once again, this time to plead that the board enthusiastically endorse supervised injection sites or services as the frontline experts call it. I've lived in Riverdale for the past 38 years. I'm a doctor and, a, and I'm a relative of an injection heroin user. On a Saturday afternoon years ago, I visited my heroin dependent relative only to awaken him and his late teen friends after an all night binge of injection heroin use. I saw plenty in the early years of the AIDS epidemic. On another Saturday afternoon, I also once woke a house full of injection of heroin users, three being my patients, in the west end of Toronto, one of whom was skeletal from AIDS, the only supplies in the house being used needles and ensure cans. It was not safe for my relative, and it was not safe for my patients. I had a heroin-dependent patient whose partner accidentally overdosed and died while injecting. He was charged with manslaughter, was fortunately acquitted. I'm an Ontario colleague, a typical straight-laced person from an upper-middle-class neighbourhood who traced her wayward injection drug using adult child to Insight in Vancouver. Her child was safe and the colleague became a convert to supervised injection services. One consequence of witnessing the devastation of HIV amongst people who inject drugs was a public decision in 1989 by the then Toronto HIV Primary Care Physician Group for its AIDS physician members to hand out clean needles in their medical offices. This occurring before Toronto Public Health initiated its needle exchange program. The downtown AIDS physicians knew that clean needles would save lives no matter how controversial actions or actions were at the time. And so it is with the supervised injection services, except it should be a lot easier this time around. The evidence is solid, whether in Canada or internationally. Supervised injection sites are safer for injection drug users and safer for the communities in which they're located. Finally, one can ignore the documented benefits to injection drug users of supervised injection sites, deride the human rights arguments which raise legitimate questions as to why a standard medical treatment should be subject to any review or vetting by citizens, and one can scorn the lifestyles of those who use drugs. But one need not be a scientist or humanist to know that supervised injection services located in an existing facility where people are already receiving clean needles can only prevent them from using in public places, conduct which puts not only the users but their neighbours at risk. Better to use under health professional supervision than on the streets. It is that simple. Thank you for the patient listening to me. Oh, that was efficient. Any questions? You ordered me to do it. <laughs> and you follow orders as well? I, I, <laughs> not, not usually from the state. Not the Dr. Berger I know, okay. <laughs> Any questions? Thank you, thank you for your ongoing work over the years. I just I'm have one pleasure. question. If you could just review a little bit the, what you mentioned in 1989 around the early harm reduction and leading to the um, clean needles at 
different community health centers. Remind us of you know, very quick. I mean, that was a time when the, the, I think John Bear was in power and wanted to do mandatory urine testing all the drug addicts and threw a bunch of needles in Queens Park and saying, why are we giving needles to people? The HIV doctors at the time, we were organized as a group, knew what the evidence was and knew that providing clean needles to addicts to use rather than sharing needles would prevent the spread of HIV. We'd seen people waste away from it in the city. The city of Toronto itself was not acting. Toronto Public Health at the time was not acting, was afraid and timid, so we figured we're going to act. And we made a press announcement and said we're going to hand out needles in our offices. Purely and simple. The police chief said they might th threaten to arrest us because we were spreading drug paraphernalia. It didn't happen, and it was months later, actually, Toronto Public Health, I think we paved the way a little bit for it. I don't mean to take credit for it. David was around at the time, actually initiated the sites at that time, early 1990, I believe, or late 1989. So it was a recognition by the doctors of the consequences of HIV spread through needles that impelled them to act professionally and ethically and provide a medical treatment through clean needles. And that's exactly what the Toronto Public Board of Public Health should be doing as far as the supervised injection services are concerned. And thank you, Dr. McEwen. Just a very quick follow-up. The incidence of HIV is lower in the City of Toronto, as a, would you say, as a direct consequence of that, uh, the clean needle program? Well, it's, it's, the incidence is lower for other reasons as well, including safer sexual practice, condom availability, HIV medications, but there's no question in the early years the availability of clean needles reduced the spread of HIV and Hep B and Hep C and all sorts of other terrible consequences of injection drug use driven underground rather than being occurring in a safe place. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. Appreciate you. your comments as always. Julia Chow, followed by Leslie Midow and then uh, Steve Barnes. Thank you. Welcome. Welcome. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. So um, I'm Julia, and I'm from Wood Green Community Services. Now, Wood Green Community Services is one of the largest social service agencies in Toronto. And for over 79 years now, Wood Green, a founding member of the United Way of Toronto, has grown to span 36 locations and serves about 37,000 people a year, and um, among whom are, uh, are homeless and marginalized people. Now, South Riverdale Community Health Centre is a valued collaborative partner with Wood Green in several programs. They have an excellent track record and expertise in the area of harm reduction and community health. Wood Green is able to support community members to benefit from these types of harm reduction initiatives through our drop-in at our 650 Queen Street location which has safe and confidential space for drug users to obtain um, clean kits. Now, Wood Green obtains the safe injection kits and safe inhalation kits from South Riverdale Community Health Center. And in last year, um, Wood Green distributed about 1,102 kits. And this initiative does reduce the occurrence of needle sharing, pipe sharing, and consequently the spread of disease in the community. However, many community members, while able to ac access um, these kits through Wood Green, do use in public washrooms or outdoors. Um, in Toronto, about 54% of individuals who inject drugs inject in a public place such as a bathroom or a stairwell. So recently, one situation occurred in the public bathroom at our 650 site. And that highlights the need for properly supervised sites. So this public bathroom that we have at our 650 site can only be used by one person at a time. And although it has sharp containers, and can be locked from inside. Uh, an, individu an individual recently was in the bathroom for some time and raised some concerns um, of our staff. Our staff tried to knock on the door and there was no answer for a while. But finally, when the person responded and said, um, he told us he had been very close to an overdose. So the potential for an overdose incident is a daily and um, a grave concern for us at Wood Green. And through, although harm reduction is part of our core approach, and our space might be safer than on the streets or in other public indoor spaces, the risk of accidental death occurring is still very high at our site. Having a supervised injection site within walking distance and overseen by South Riverdale Community Health Centre would benefit community members and create a safer environment at large. 
Um, we believe that a supervised injection site would decrease the, over rate, the overall rate um, of overdose and public use. In addition, we feel that um, having a site would really encourage community <coughs> members um, to get easier access to other types of services, including rehab. So Wood Green fully supports the proposal of South Riverdale Community Health Center managing a supervised injection site, and we encourage the Board of Health to continue to engage in dialogue and um, engage in broader consultations. Thank you. Thank you very much, Julia. Are there any questions? Seeing none, we appreciate your comments. Next is Leslie Vidal, followed by Steve Barnes, and then Kevin Lee. Welcome. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, Board of Health members. Thank you for um, allowing me to speak on this issue. Um, my name is Leslie Midaw. I'm here in my capacity as a board member of South Riverdale. You've heard from my colleague, Su Susan Varden. As Susan has already mentioned, there is obviously strong and unanimous support on the South Riverdale board for the proposal that's before the board today. But um, I'm really, I'm here to speak to you today more in my capacity as a community member of uh, Leslieville. I live only a few blocks away from South Riverdale. I am a mother of four, kids under 10. Um, I've been very active in the community for the past 10 years. And I think at its heart, I, I'm here because I believe that a community is judged by how it treats its most vulnerable members. And I moved to Leslieville because it was an inclusive and diverse community. And I believe that the situation of a social program like a, su a supervised injection site in our community will affirm the value of inclusiveness um, and compassion in the Leslieville community. Um, so as I said, um, I've, I'm an active and longtime member of the Leslieville community. A uh, community which I care deeply about and to which I feel very connected. While I can't say I speak for all members of the Leslieville community, um, I do believe there is strong support for the idea that this program will save and improve lives and make the community safer. Um, since the announcement last Monday of the proposal, I have been reaching out to friends and neighbors, both in person and online. Uh, through, through, through social media. I have um, started a Leslieville Supports uh, Supervised Injection Sites uh, Facebook page, and we've also started a local petition of support, um, which to date has over 500 signatures. Uh, it is directed at those who live and work in Leslieville. And um, the response, as I said, we've had 500 signatures on that, um, on that petition as well as incredible support in uh, local Facebook pages. There are those that have a different view, um, but I think that it's fair to say that the response from the community has really been remarkable and incredibly heartwarming. It's made me very proud to be a Leslie Villian. Um, many people have demonstrated not simply tolerance, but genuine support for and real understanding of the pressing uh, public health issue at stake and the need for the service in our community. Um, and uh, one of the comments I'd just like to share from one of our community members, and this is, I think, representative of the kind of things I'm hearing from my, um, my fellow, uh, my neighbors and friends. Um, as a nurse and resident of the Leslieville area, I fully support this initiative. The evidence shows that SIS saves lives and supports inclusive, healthy, and safe communities. Uh, again. Sorry, Leslie. Yes, absolutely. Just, just give you your final bit. Absolutely. Um, and just the only other issue that I'd like to raise is the issue of community safety, and that is a concern that some folks have raised, and I do strongly believe that this will, in fact, uh, increase public safety by reducing public drug use and by uh, decreasing the number of uh, needles that we find in our community. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you very much. Are there questions? Thank you very much, Leslie, for your good work. Next is Steve Barnes, followed by Kevin Lee, and then Jill LeBlanc. Good afternoon. Great. Thanks very much. So my name is Steve Barnes. I'm the Director of Policy at the Wellesley Institute, and we are Toronto's health think tank. So as you've heard today, there's a strong case for supervised injection sites as part of a harm reduction approach to drug use. 
Supervised injection sites serve two very important purposes. They provide a safer environment for drug users to inject pre-obtained drugs under medical supervision, and they provide basic um, public health and healthcare services to drug users who may not otherwise come into contact with these services. But today I'd like to highlight a third important aspect of these services, which is the role that these services can play in addressing the social determinants of health for drug users. Integrated, so, uh, integrated supervised injection services can provide critical referrals to health and social supports like addictions treatment, primary health care, and housing services that can improve the health and well-being of drug users. And we know that Torontonians with low income and other dimensions of disadvantage are sicker and die earlier than those who are better off. And the three locations that you're considering uh, serve those populations. While drug users come from all parts of our society, there's evidence that shows that drug-related morbidity and mortality is greater among groups with lower socioeconomic status. And the connections between socioeconomic status and drug use are bi-directional. So this means that some populations who fare poorly in the social determinants of health may be more likely to become drug users, and drug users in turn are more likely to <coughs> fare poorly in the social determinants of health. <coughs> Excuse me. So strategies to reduce the harms of drug use must therefore address both drug use behavior and the social determinants of health. Research from the Insight Clinic in Vancouver found that clients who were in contact with the service were more likely to enter addiction treatment services than those who were not, and it was primarily, primarily for detox and addiction treatment. Once drug users enter these kinds of treatments, the path toward improved housing stability and income security become much clearer but they cannot find those paths if they die due, due to overdose. Housing referrals are an especially important aspect of supervised injection su services. Evidence shows that inadequate housing increases the likelihood of infectious disease transmission among drug users. We also know that people who lack stable housing are the group of drug users who are most likely to use supervised injection services. These services therefore can be the critical link between an especially high risk subsection of the homeless population and referrals to social services like supportive housing. I'm not actually going to end with my big bang at the end because I can read the, <coughs> the mood of the room and clearly you've heard from people today from a vast cross-section of our city who all agree that this is the right thing to do so I'll just end by adding my name to the list of people who are here to encourage and support you to do the right thing. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we appreciate your comments to Steve. Thank you. Any questions? Seeing none. Next is uh, Kevin Lee. Thank you very much, Bill, Mr. Bill Chair. LeBlanc and then oh, Jeff okay. DeMel. All right. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. I just want to start off by saying Skyden Court Community Center is in full support of uh, the SIS. We're located at Bathurst, uh, just about a block down from um, the West, the Queen West. And I just wanna start off by saying that I think the Queen West uh, is a ideal site. It's a, um, a community health center that's grounded in the community. It's a community center that has uh, understanding of the marginalized that they have worked with for many years. Our community is actually a very unique one. It's uh, located, both Scadding and Queen West, right on the boundaries of Ward 19 and Ward 20. We've got million dollar homes, we've got a, a social housing project, and as you know, uh, Queen West distributes uh, 300,000 needles. Well, those needles go somewhere, folks. At Scadding Court, we're just a block down. And I could tell you that uh, we do our due diligence along with parks to check the playground for syringes, condoms, and so forth. And ladies and gentlemen, we're finding them on a regular basis. Uh, further to that, uh, since I knew I was coming here, I had took the liberty of speaking to some of the parents, uh, both from the, the million dollar homes and both from social housing. Uh, because at Skiding, we've witnessed this. We've witnessed people coming into the lobby of Skiding Court uh, just high as a kite. 
all right? Uh, so there are various things, uh, protocol that we've got in place, right from calling someone for, you know, a referral to treatment to enforcement. Um, if the person becomes um, obtrusive towards other patrons. So in speaking with some of these parents and families about the um, SIS uh, site, and once they understood what it was all about in terms of that, the people are already there. They're in support of it, because the reason why they're in support of it is, it's not just you know for their own safety and the safety of, of their kids, but it's building a more cohesive community. Those people are not gonna leave in terms of uh, the, mar the marginalized, nor are the rich people who've just come in and bought a $1.5 million home. So I think there's an understanding that you know we've got to figure out a way of how to include that dis-marginalized group into the community and it's about time that this piece of the continuum um, has to be established. So I applaud uh, uh, Dr. McEwen and uh, Councillor Cressy for the leadership in the city to make this happen, not just for the drug users, but also for the residents in the city of Toronto. So we fully embrace and will support um, uh, uh, Queen West in the implementation or whatever is required to get the education and the messaging out for this needed project. Lastly, Mr. Chair, we could go and do more consultations, certainly, if that's part of the process, but I urge you, I urge you to figure out a way how we can expedite this so it's not going to happen in two years' time, but this has to happen sooner than later. Thank you very much. Kevin, thank you very much. Seeing no questions, we'll move on to Jill LeBlanc, followed by Jeff Demel, I'm sorry if I mispronounced that, and then Claire Haxell. So first is uh, Jill LeBlanc. Jill LeBlanc, going once, going twice. Okay, then Jeff Demel. This Jeff? Yes. Welcome, Jeff. Hello. Thank the you. Works Community Advisory Committee. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everybody. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to the board. I uh, spent all weekend writing this, and uh, I think it's pretty clear in the room. I don't even need to read it. Um, you, you can submit it, by the way, if it's, will, if it's a written piece. I will do that. I'm going to keep this short and brief. I think there's a few things. Uh, I'm from Jeff Demel, by the way. I'm, I'm uh, from the Works um, Community Advisory Committee. It's a committee made up of drug users and former drug users. And uh, we advise on all sorts of topics. Uh, that impact the, uh, the, works the works services, the harm reduction program directly. So I think there's only a few things that, uh, that I want to mention because it's all been said here and I think, I think it's been said very well. Uh, geez, I had a whole thing written out. All right, my computer died. Rogers. So. <laughs> Jeff, say what you need to say. I will. It's only going to take a second. It's only one thing. So I think one thing we missed upon, one thing we haven't touched is that these services, these injection sites, they bring people in and they keep people in. I talked to a user just this morning who told me that he's more likely to, to seek help or to, to speak to a person after he uses. So as it stands now, we give them their supplies, we give them their advice, we give them the good advice that we have, the support, and we send them on their way to use in the community. And we're right here, over here, just, just on the other side of the square. And there's been recent deaths in the, in, the, uh, in, the, in the last year, I think there's been a couple of overdoses in the, in the area. And it's safe to say that these wouldn't have happened if a, if a safe injection site were, were just around the corner. Um, I think if there's one thing that can be learned from, uh, I would say my story, which I was gonna share, it's offering multiple services in one location while fostering relationships, it will garner more effective and better health outcomes. So we need safe injection services, we do. Uh, to the NIMBYs, the not in my backyards, well, I'm looking to purchase a home in South Riverdale as we speak, and I say to that, please, in my backyard. Um, I'm sorry, I'm just scanning through this. Every injection that occurs in a safe place is one less that doesn't occur in the community. We already know that. It'll keep supplies indoors. 
And these programs already offer a full range of services from attaining health care, comprehensive referrals, clean supplies, tips for safer injection, and let's not say, you know what, spreading of healthy information. When you get users together and you teach them best practice, they're more likely to go out in the community and use with co-users and friends and share that best practice. All in the end, that will reduce infections in the community, hospital visits, emergency room stays, all of that will be affected. How this cannot pass, I don't know. Bottom line, folks, the existing clients will use this supervised injection service. I would have. I'd like to note that I'm a former drug user. I have not used in eight years, but if I do choose to use again, I'm probably going to use a South Riverdale. Uh, one question, should we move forward with community co consultations? I'm not even sure that it is a question. I don't even think it's up for debate. Not to act now would be negligent and short-sighted. That's it. My three minutes. You were right on there. Thank you very much, Jeff. We appreciate your comments and your good work. Next is Claire Haxel and then Dr. Ahmed Bayoumi. Hi, thank you. My name is Claire Haxel. I'm the Director of Health Services at Planned Parenthood Toronto. We're a community health centre for youth, 13 to 29. We represent 10,000 patients from across the city of Toronto. Um, like I say, everyone is a young person who comes to see us. But between 2010 and 2013, I lived in Vancouver and I was a manager at the Portland Hotel Society, which manages Insight, which is another place that I have worked. Um, in my current role, people often ask me, well, doesn't harm reduction, don't injection sites tell young people that it's okay to use drugs and that you can just boogie on down there and, and use your drugs there? Um, what I often say is I cite all the research from uh, out of Insight that says, no, that's not true, and that there is no evidence that injection sites encourage drug use among young people. What they do do is send a message that drug users are allowed to live with dignity, that drug users are welcome in our community health centers and in our communities, that drug users' health matters, and that the lives of drug users matter. Um, we talked a little bit about how do you convince someone that an injection site would be in their community, and I think you do that by listening to the stories of drug users, listening to their families, um, and just reminding folks that drug users are already a part of our communities. Um, the message that you do send if you do not approve this motion is that drug, li drug users' lives do not matter and that the city is not interested in comprehensive approaches to addiction. Um, so in my role as the director at Planned Parenthood, I'm here to say that our community health center, and I believe you've received letters from the AOHC in general, saying that we fully support this motion and we strongly encourage Dr. McEwen's consultations. <coughs> Very quick. <laughs> You, this is great. Thank you. Thank you very much, Claire. We appreciate your comments and no know the good work that Planned Parenthood does. Thanks. Thank you. Dr. Amund, uh, Bayami, Tosca, which is the Toronto and Ottawa Supervised Consumption Assessment Study. Hi, I'm a, I'm a physician and researcher at the Centre for Research on New City Health at St. Michael's Hospital and of Health Policy uh, and a Professor of Medicine and of Health Policy Management and Evaluation at the University of Toronto. I'm here today as one of the lead investigators of the TOSCA study, which you've uh, heard something about already today, uh, along with Dr. Carol Strike from the University of Toronto. Uh, TOSCA was a feasibility and needs assessment for supervised injection services. We used multiple different scientific research methods to generate our recommendations. You've heard a lot about the evidence already, so I'm going to try and focus on things that uh, I think are, haven't been emphasized today. Um, but I do want to start by emphasizing that the main reason to open supervised injection facilities is quite simply to improve the health and well-being of people who inject drugs. There are many other reasons, uh, such as moving drugs use out of parks and alleys and, and their economic benefits, but the primary reason is to save lives and to improve quality of life. People who inject drugs are more likely than the general population to die at an early age, and if they don't die, they have a high burden of disease. Harm reduction interventions such as supervised injection services are an important and effective way to address the health issues for people who inject drugs and people who need something beyond conventional health care. Um, we've already heard about overdoses. Uh, as has been widely reported, overdose rates have increased markedly in Toronto. What is less well appreciated, I think, is, is that overdose rates have increased even more rapidly in Western Canada and parts of the United States. We are now starting to see increased use of drugs like fentanyl and heroin in Ontario. Overdose rates may soon increase even more in Toronto. 
uh, if, if there is no public health response. The time to act to prevent further overdose-related deaths is now. Uh, we recommended uh, three integrated uh, facilities, as did uh, Dr. McEwen in our report. Uh, I, I want to briefly uh, review some of the reasons for that. Stigma, discrimination, and privacy. People who use drugs benefit from having services delivered in environments that are free of discrimination, where drug use is not stigmatized, and where their privacy will be respected. The three proposed facilities are located within organizations that have a long history of providing exceptionally high quality services to people who use drugs. Access, an integrated model increases the potential to access a wide range of health services and social services. Efficiency, integrating supervised injection services into existing facilities avoids duplicating already existing services. Scale up, because providers in existing facilities have established relationships with people who use drugs, these facilities have the potential for timely development of a client base for supervised injection. And community integration, integrating supervised injection services within facilities where people are already receiving harm reduction services will help to address concerns about how to incorporate supervised injection into neighborhoods. And finally, cost. Delivering supervised injection services in pre-existing facilities is less costly and potentially more cost effective than establishing freestanding supervised injection facilities. That's, this is an important consideration for implementation, but it's also important when considering how many facilities should be established. When we conducted the economic analysis, we looked at the potential cost of operating a facility, the potential cost savings from avert, averting adverse health effects associated with injection drugs, and projected health benefits. The important point here is that we base our operating costs on the experience of freestanding facilities, such as those in Vancouver and Australia. And as we gain experience with the model being proposed in Toronto, it's important to monitor the associated costs, as it may very well be cost effective to have even more facilities than the three proposed in the future. I want to talk very briefly about uh, the importance of community consultation. It'd be good if you went to in conclusion, therefore. Um, <clears throat> so uh, in conclusion, um, the next few months are going to offer an important opportunity to have an, a respectful dialogue that's both an education and a collaboration among the people of Toronto to address the health needs of people who use drugs and hopefully to start a broader public dialogue about our society's approach to drug use and addiction. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate your comments. Are there any questions? Very quick question. Do you have any, any cost numbers around how much is saved by through safe injection site, because some folks really like those numbers. Yeah, so we know- Per capita uh, basis. When we did the analysis for Vancouver, <clears throat> we estimated that there was cost savings over 10 years of about $14 million. Uh, we don't, because we don't know what the operating costs are gonna be here, it's hard to project what the, the cost uh, is gonna be. Uh, but we, uh, it certainly will be uh, cost effective. We estimate to operate three facilities, and those were based on very conservative assumptions. Right, great, thank you very much. Okay, next is uh, Mark Ashton, Fred Victor Center, followed by Margaret Harvey, then Gary Thompson. Welcome, Mark. Thanks, there'll be two of us speaking very briefly in my slot. Uh, Fred Victor Center is a not-for-profit agency that provides housing, health, and community services to low-income and homeless Torontonians. We're also one of the 47 community agencies that works with Toronto Public Health to provide harm reduction supply access. In 2016, Fred Victor's largest site at 145 Queen East anticipates distributing approximately 22,000 sterile needles. I'm speaking in support of opening a network of supervised injection sites in Toronto at the three reference sites and in support of the next step of conducting an expedited community, a coordinated community consultation process for all the reasons that have been previously stated. So I'm going to skip over that. Um, Fred Victor's experience at our service sites very much validates the need for supervised injection sites. At a shelter, for example, women are provided sterile injection supplies. Being homeless, they have nowhere to use but in a public space. This subjects them to the dangers associated with public drug use, including assault and the negative health impacts of using in an unsupervised and unhygienic space. At a second service location, people use in washrooms, alcoves, and other unsupervised spaces, and often experience health problems, including acute issues such as overdose, at a service location that is not always able to respond to these occurrences in the most effective way. 
a network of supervised injection sites will have a positive impact upon these health and safety concerns. Two final points from me. The three identified agencies are highly competent and well respected in the sector and they have the ability to deliver the services being considered in a coordinated, competent and responsive manner. And finally, uh, supervised injection sites, in my opinion, are really about health equity. They will provide very needed health services to some of Toronto's most vulnerable and unwell residents who are currently not being provided the health services that they need. Thank you. Hi, I'm Carrie Komodo. I'm a, is this working? I'm a harm reduction. Look towards you. Look towards you. Okay, I'm a harm reduction worker at Fred Victor and I do informal counseling for drug users. Um, and kind of just what I want to say, because most people have uh, hit a lot of points, is that it's the meaningful intervention that you can make with clean injection sites because you have relationships with people and they trust you. Um, so when you get to the root um, of people's issues and why they're using, it's actually complex trauma, com comorbid issues, such as mental health issues, historical abuse. Um, so just because clean injection sites don't eliminate drugs doesn't mean that that's not a facet of, of getting well because you can't just take away a drug. You have to get to the root issues of why people are, are using and it, it reflects some of the ills um, in our broader society and having uh, healthcare professionals and workers that can speak to those issues in a compassionate way makes all the difference in terms of a long-term plan for an individual that's suffering um, from addiction and it's not that uh, people with addictions uh, struggle with moral issues. We all struggle with substance issues um, as people living in society, whether it's coffee or Netflix or whatever. Um, and ev and everyone, everyone deserves that. Thank you very much. Appreciate your comments. Are there any <laughs> questions? Okay, I think you st struck a chord there. Uh, Margaret Harvey, Gary Thompson, and Kathy Adams. Margaret? Hi. Welcome, Margaret. Good afternoon. I'm, I'm here um, as a resident in the Riverdale community. And if you'll just excuse me, I've just written my statement, so. My name is Margaret Harvey and I live in Riverdale with my husband Peter and our two children. When we bought our house in 2004, we fell in love with the neighborhood and not just for its leafy parks, amazing Danforth restaurants and trendy Queen Street East. We also love the sense of community that we felt as soon as we moved in. We love the values of caring, inclusiveness, and kindness demonstrated by our former MP Jack Layton, our current MP Julie DeBrusson, our MPP Peter Tabbins, and our ward councillor Paula Fletcher. Values that seem to flow both ways to and from them and the people who live there and elected them. After we moved in, a close cousin, Stephen Barbier, also made his home nearby in Leslieville, where he now owns two houses and lives on Moore Street around the corner from the South Riverdale Community Health Center, raising his two daughters. We spend a lot of time together in Riverdale and Leslieville and have discussed the potential for a safe injection site in our community and we are both very supportive of this initiative. I have seen firsthand how the community has changed over the years and the positive impact that the South Riverdale Community Health Centre has had. I have done some research and based on what I've read about similar projects in Vancouver, this can only be a good thing for our community. My children, aged eight and nine, both attend Holy Name Catholic School, and one of the things I love about that school is that the wide catchment area provides them exposure to a very demographic. It's a very inclusive community, and no one gets left behind. I feel that the inclusive values of our school are shared by the wider community of Riverdale and Leslieville. As a community, we owe it to ourselves and to each other to make harm reduction a priority to give the vulnerable a chance to get the help they need and to make our streets, parks, and other public safe spaces safer for everyone. That's it. Wow, well thank you, Margaret. We appreciate your comments. Any questions? Okay. <coughs> Gary Thompson, Kathy Adams, and Valerie Sepka. Gary, welcome Gary, nice yeah. to see you. Welcome all. Kind of thought this was gonna be a busy day, so I made it short. <laughs> We'll see. <laughs> <laughs> well, unless you want to ask questions, lots of questions, I'm open. Yeah, I'm pressing the green now. Okay. Safer consumption sites long overdue establishes trust in the system by consumers, a place where users can interact with medical professionals, seek addiction services on their own timeline, and a multi-services available. Other jurisdictions show that safer consumption sites are good for the community and society as a whole. 
We need to stop this war on drugs, which is a war on humanity. My grandmother, a lifelong recreational opioid user, a wonderful lady, and no one in the family batted an eye about her use. Opoids have been around for 5,000 years. Go back in your ancestry, you will find someone that used opoids recreationally. I personally, is my drug of choice, is opoids, which still does not stop me from living with the philosophy of an injury to one is an injury to all. Quote, Dr. Luce and Dr. O Orkin, opoid use users deserve the same high quality evidence-based practice as other patients. Journal of the American Medical Society, 2013, volume 309, issue nine, page 873. Thank you very much. Gary, said with great efficiency. We appreciate your comments, Gary. Now as always, any questions? Okay, seeing none. Kathy Adams, Valerie Zepka, Matt Johnson. Welcome, uh, Kathy, from uh, St. Stephen's Community House. Hi. Hi. Sorry, which one am I to see you. Okay. Good afternoon. Pull the mic right to you. Sorry. Good afternoon. My name is Kathy Adams. I'm here today to be a voice to why I feel safe injection sites are needed here in Toronto. There are many reasons why safe injection sites are needed, but I'm going to speak of my own experience, experiences with drugs and needle use. I started using drugs and needles when I was young. My boyfriend at the time would make up my fix and he would also inject it into me. I didn't learn to use my own needles until I was in my late 20s. I made several mistakes and in doing so I caused myself more problems. I got abscesses and blood poisoning on a number of, of, of occasions. I had to be hospitalized for days, even weeks. If I had access to places like a safe injection site, I would have gotten care for my infection sooner and it would have probably saved the hospital trip altogether. If I had had access to places like a safe injection site sooner, I would have been able to connect with housing and harm reduction services. I also would have accessed health care in a more timely manner. I didn't start using harm reduction services until about 2011. A friend introduced me to an all-woman's drop-in center and I started going for meals instead of starving on the streets. From there, I was introduced to harm reduction and today, here in front of you, I am three years sober. I am proof that harm reduction works. I have spent the last three years working through my addiction and my other issues as I have a long journey ahead of, my, ahead of me. The only difference today is that I'm not alone in my journey anymore because I am able to connect with services and others like myself. Today I am contributing to my community through peer work with St. Stephen's Community House and working with people that, are, that have similar issues and giving people hope that when they're ready for their own journey, myself and people alike, will be there to help them on the way. We lost 206 people to overdose related deaths here in Toronto last year. Help us save lives from disease and death here in Toronto. Thank you very much. We appreciate you speaking from uh, your experience especially. Questions? Seeing none, Valerie Zepka, followed by Matt Johnson and Roxanne Danielson. Welcome. Thank you. Councillor Mihavich, uh, Dr. McEwen, thank you for the opportunity to speak in support of supervised injection uh, services. My close friend and colleague Lee Chapman has asked me to recount the tragic story of her bro brother Brad's death by overdose last summer. As a resident of Riverdale and a nurse practitioner with a vested personal and professional interest in harm reduction strategies, such as those offered by supervised injection services, I'm proud to represent the Chapman family here today. 
There's overwhelming evidence that supervised injection services help to reduce deaths from overdoses, reduce the transmission of infectious diseases, increase access to detox and other addiction treatment services, and improve overall community safety. These are obvious win-wins for communities and society at large. Besides the strong evidence base for supervised injection services, there is a moral imperative to help those who are vulnerable. Councillor Mihevich, I know you will be familiar with the story of Brad Chapman, brother of my friend Lee Chapman. Lee spoke at the Community Development and Recreation Meeting in support of the proposed Salvation Army Hope Shelter in Leslieville, which has now been unanimously approved. Others may have read the recent Toronto Star story chronicling Brad's death from overdose in an article entitled The Invisible Dead. Although Lee sends her regrets for today's hearing, she wanted me to share how supervised injection services would have saved Brad's life. Brad developed an addiction to opiates when he was diagnosed with a brain tumor 20 years ago. When his supply of OxyContin was cut off, Brad sought other means of accessing drugs, which unfortunately also meant that he acquired hepatitis C as a consequence of inter intravenous drug use. Fast forward to 2015, where Brad was a frequent flyer at The Works, a needle exchange program near Young and Dundas Square. Brad felt at home at The Works, chatting with staff and friends, and also frequently used the phone there to call home and check in with her mother. It is both ironic and sad that Brad overdosed on Walton Street, just a few short blocks north of The, wor blocks north of the Works. Had Brad been able to use a supervised injection site, staff would have quickly detected that he had overdosed, administered naloxone, and opened his airway. Instead, Brad shot up alone in an alley in the entrance of a nail parlor in front of the Chelsea Hotel. Police arrived on scene and watched Brad take his final breaths. His head slumped forward, occluding his airway. In fact, over the span of 13 minutes with the police on scene, by the time the paramedics arrived, Brad went from active and moving to pulseless. He had suffered respiratory and cardiac arrest. And what was most troubling to the Chapman family is that there's no record of him receiving any first aid or CPR while police were awaiting the paramedics. With his mother, siblings, and children gathered at his bedside in the hospital, Brad died eight days later when life support was, was withdrawn. The availability of a supervised injection service would have made a difference in Brad's life. He was an experienced intravenous drug user. The Chapman family was quite sure his overdose was accidental or that his supply had been adulterated, potentially even with street fentanyl. Although he knew he was engaging in risky behavior with his habit, he did not have the agency to be able to change his tragic outcome. This is where others would have come in. It is likely that had Brad chosen to inject in a supervised facility instead of a dark corner on a downtown street as he did, he likely would have survived. Just like one homeless shelter will not solve homelessness in the GTA, one or rather three supervised injection sites will not remedy Toronto's addictions problems. But there is a moral imperative for the Board of Health to initiate the consultation process for supervised injection services. Doing so sends a strong message that you as a board are making evidence-based policy decisions despite how polarizing and unpopular this issue may be. Lee and I look forward to your leadership on this matter and as nurses and family members, we thank you for protecting society's most vulnerable individuals. I believe we share a common purpose in this regard. Thank you. Thank you very much. Difficult the story as it is. Uh, Matt, Matt, <coughs> Matt Johnson is next, uh, followed by Roxanne, and then Brooklyn. Hi, uh, I'm a member of the Toronto Harm Reduction Alliance. Um, I'm not gonna talk about Hep C or HIV because it's already been uh, covered from people before me. Um, and to be honest, it's not new information either. This isn't, these stats aren't anything new. We've known this for years and years and years. Um, safe injection sites have been running quite successfully in Europe for decades. Uh, and in the year 2000, Portugal decriminalized all substances and has seen substance use rates drop, uh, particularly among youth. So none of this is a surprise. None of this is new, new information. Um, it's just whether we actually do something about it now. Uh, or, or continue with the status quo, which is a, a multi-decade long drug war, which has, has you know, been a failure from the beginning. What I would like to talk about instead um, is what it's like to be an injection drug user in Toronto right now without an injection site. Um, I am a long time uh, injection drug user. I started when I was uh, quite a young man, uh, when I was 
struggling with mental health issues uh, that were quite severe and was, was quite sure that I was, I was gonna commit suicide. Uh, and I had one sort of last ditch effort, which was uh, if, I, you know, if I don't have much of a life anyways, I might as well just give drugs a shot. Uh, I grew up on the 80s PSAs, you know, this is your brain, this is your brain on drugs with the egg, so I didn't think there was a safe way to use drugs. Uh, I was really fortunate in that the first time I went into a, a needle exchange, uh, I went to the works and ran into a, a, an incredible worker who took the time with a very young, very scared uh, man to um, show me how to do a safe injection, which I didn't know was possible at the time. Um, Every person that I used with is hep C positive, uh, and I don't have hep C. So it, that's two things. One is the, the works, that particular person especially, who showed me how to do it uh, in a safer way, and also a fair amount of luck. Um, although I knew how to inject safely, uh, when you, you are forced to inject in um, dirty bathrooms where you are terrified that that door is gonna bust open at any second, um, safety starts to go out the window, um, and you start to worry about hands shaking, spilling stuff on the counter, and what do I do then? This is my last 50 bucks that's just spilled on a dirty bathroom counter, and I know I'm gonna have to suck that up, right? Um, we also know that people who are street involved and injection drug users uh, face increased violence, uh, increased police surveillance, um, and I just, I can't, uh, I don't think I can explain to you to the, the fear uh, and paranoia that goes along with the police not being your friend, but being a constant source of worry about whether you're gonna go to jail today and have to go detox in jail. Um, you have a great opportunity um, you know, to either continue to send drug, drug users the message that we don't count, we don't matter, we're not, we don't have a place in society, which is what we are currently being told, or you can send a message saying you do have a place, you do matter, and your health is important. Thanks. Matt, uh, thank you very much. We appreciate your story. Next is um, Roxanne Danielson, followed by Brooklyn McNeil. Hello, I'm Welcome. Roxy. Thank you to the Board of Health for considering moving forward with the recommendation of the proposed safe injection services. It is such an honor to speak here today in support of this important initiative. As a nurse working in inner city Toronto in mental health and addictions, I've had the privilege of working with many people from all walks of life, including folks who use in, uh, opiates intravenously. Some of the most important conversations I've had with people are about harm reduction and how to use safely. Unfortunately, because of the rise of fentanyl and accidental overdose, a lot of what I do is recommend getting naloxone training. About a year ago, I spoke to a man who overdosed alone and needed to be rushed to hospital, and he acknowledged he almost died because help did not come quickly enough and no naloxone was available. However, he told me, the funny thing is, is I had naloxone on me, but you can't administer naloxone to yourself when you're overdosed. His words really made me think of all the people I spoke to about naloxone training. It saddens me to say that some of the same people I've spoken to about getting naloxone training have since died by overdose because no one was around to help them. It is inhumane that as a society we punish people and make them feel so unwanted that people are going in isolated and sometimes dangerous areas to use by themselves where they may accidentally overdose since they are too uncomfortable um, to use around others where help uh, can easily come if needed. Or, even if you are using with other people, people are hesitant to call 911 when their friend overdose out of fear of being punished because of how criminalized drug use is. Since I moved to Toronto almost two years ago to work as a nurse, I have lost more people to overdose and homelessness than I could ever have even imagined. It is horrible to think that had there been safe injection sites and more resources available for my clients, they could be alive today. With places like Insight already up and running, we know safe inj injection sites do save lives, decrease hep C and HIV transmission rates, and do not increase crime rates in the neighborhoods where they are situated. I fully support safe injection sites and truly hope that Toronto can be more accepting and open to meeting people where they are at, prioritizing safety over judgment, predicating harm reduction in Toronto, and more importantly, start putting lives first in the community we serve. Thank you for your time. Roxanne, we appreciate uh, your comments, yeah. And uh, Roxanne was from the Inner City Family Health Team, thank you. Last but not least, the final word is uh, Brooklyn McNeil. 
Welcome, Brooklyn. Thank you Hi. for in. So my name is Brooklyn McNeil. Um, I'm 22 years old. I'm a community peer and street outreach worker in the realm of harm reduction. I grew up in Thunder Bay, which is a city where it still is. Addiction is a huge issue for many people. I grew up with a father. He was an addict himself. I started using at 12 years old and became addicted to opiates at the age of 16 and began injecting at the age of 18, the same year I became homeless. Without the harm reduction philosophy in general, I would have not come as far as I have. I've attempted to get proper treatment and quit. Many of my resources have come from addicts and harm reduction workers over, say, um, counselors and therapists uh, at the rehab. With not much luck, I began to appreciate harm reduction methods in general. Clean works, gear, and being trained on naloxone, for example, are two things that have saved my life over and over. Um, I've had mos uh, I've had multiple hospitalizations and I've also overdosed multiple times. Uh, from my own experience, bathrooms are one of the go-to places um, for people to inject um, or do drugs in any using any method. Um, just Tim Hortons, McDonald's, and I've had, from my experience, either they're keeping a close eye on you and watching how long you're in there, or they have no idea you're in there. So either way, I would be scared um, and trying to barricade the door, which is not a good idea, or um, I'd be rushed out and not doing it properly, maybe putting too much in my spoon or things like that. Um, I've also met dealers and users who have intentionally overdosed others and in my most recent overdose I do believe that this was the case. Um, it happened in November at the Tim Hortons in front of the works which was a very lucky lucky situation. Um, I literally I was revived there with naloxone. The man that had overdosed me dropped me in there and I was they were, started their um, CPR and naloxone administration right away. Um, I was saved and I literally watched the dry erase board go from one number to one number up, uh, the number of lives saved. So that touched me like very much. Um, I've also had many of my friends overdose and which all of them I think, well all accidental overdoses I believe should be prevented or can be prevented by um, by safe injection sites. Uh, in Vancouver, something that I had heard that they, they've had so many overdoses and not one of them has been fatal, that really also affected me. Um, I think that safe injection sites would provide more education to people. For example, for, uh, for the six times I've overdosed, three out of those six times I had been mixing either a benzo or an um, alcohol with it. Not a lot of people are aware of the extensive danger of that. Um, perhaps naloxone could even be a requirement for people to have like training on as, while they enter the safe injection site. And for my last point, um, just on my way here, uh, I dropped off some clean works to my friend um, and I told her what I was going to be doing here and very excited about speaking. She grabbed my hands and said thank you. I just, uh, she didn't know if this would actually be passing or not, but I could feel her appreciation making it clear to me the importance of these sites. Respect for all members of the community is so important, especially um, looking, not looking at as addicts as invaders, but as part of the community. Um, also, it has created uh, an opportunity or, um, sorry, it has created um, kind of a curiosity as to what it would be like to even be someone that works at a safe injection site as I've already started my, um, my journey in the realm of harm reduction. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. We really, really appreciate it. And it's great, Brooklyn, that you had the last word, I think. Yeah. Any questions? Okay, I want to thank all the deputants for your comments. Uh, the next step of the process is we have an opportunity as Board of Health members to ask questions of the Medical Officer of Health. Conscious that I know at least one person 
has to leave before four o'clock. Uh, so if we could do that with some efficiency in the same rule that we applied to our deputants, we're gonna to apply to ourselves. So I'm gonna suggest that we do three minutes and not more than three minutes when we speak. So questions of staff, Peter. Thank you, Joe. Uh, this this uh, question is directed at uh, Dr. McEwen. Um, thank you for presenting um, about the uh, SIS program and the, it's very much needed and I will be in fully support of the program. Um, on your last slide, um, you note here that uh, we expect SIS to improve health outcomes. Um, I just have two short questions around uh, program evaluation. Who will be responsible for program evaluation? Um, and uh, how will we actually know that health outcomes are improving? The, the program evaluation hasn't been designed yet, but we anticipate working with an experienced researcher so that there's a degree of objectivity to the evaluation. Uh, I would anticipate that the kinds of measures that would be used would be, in some cases, health outcome measures, other cases, uh, uh, utilization service delivery measures. Uh, I imagine we'll be looking for feedback from both users and the community in terms of their experience of the program. All of these are the kinds of things I would anticipate would be part of an evaluation which hasn't really been designed yet. We're good. Councillor Doucette. Thank you very much. Earlier this afternoon, um, we were being asked questions, and I'm going to ask those questions if I get these correct. I know in our report we're looking for you to be reporting back in July. Can you just give us the time frame of what you're going to be doing between then, between now and then, just very quickly so everyone understands the process? Well, the, um, the community consultation will take place between now and then. We are in the process of retaining an outside organization to conduct the, uh, the uh, consultation. And you've heard through some of the questions and answers some of what that consultation will look like. Uh, once the information comes in from the consultation, we need to actually look at it, uh, identify what are the main themes we're hearing, and we need to actually have a response for any concerns that are, are uh, raised in the consultation. That's part of the requirement for material that has to be submitted to the federal government. Uh, you know, I think the spirit of that question was, uh, was one of a sense of urgency, and I think uh, you know, we, we all felt a sense of urgency in bringing this issue forward to the Board of Health, which has, if anything, only increased with the most recent data that we have from overdose deaths in 2014. Um, this board has taken a position critical of the federal legislation which requires such an extensive set of documentation and you've heard some critique from some of the uh, people who've spoken to the board today. Uh, however, that is the law right now uh, and I would, uh, I would want to bring forward an application for exemption which was going to be successful. Uh, one of the Historically, for those sites that have received a, an exemption in Canada, the time that the federal government takes to assess has been the longest part of the process. So we want to make sure that we bring forward something which the federal government is likely to approve. Uh, so I think it's important to get the community consultation part right uh, without uh, uh, moving any more slowly than necessary, but we do want to get that part right. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. That's helpful. Councillor Nunziata, questions? Thank you. A um, couple of questions. First of all, um, the two sites that we have uh, in Canada, in Vancouver, um, how, how long have uh, the sites in Vancouver been open? And do we have any information on what, you know, the stats are and if they've been successful or have there been any problems? Well, Insight has been open for more than a decade. Um, the Dr. Peter Center, can someone help me with a number? Just a year previous. Just a year previous. My, much of, the, um, uh, much of the data which has gone into our assessment of the effectiveness of supervised injection comes from existing sites, including Insight. Uh, so a lot of research was done around Insight, and as you know, it was the subject of a Supreme Court challenge. So the Supreme Court took a look at all of the information and evidence as well. So it's probably one of the better studied sites around the world. Okay, uh, my next question is as far as community consultation. Um, you've answered a, a few questions and Councillor Fletcher asked a question to the deputant that they were proposing um, open houses and so forth. Um, is the consultation meeting not going to be, um, is it just gonna be focused in the, in where 
the three sites are, are we gonna focus citywide and try to get input and are we gonna consult with everyone in the city, not just <coughs> where the three sites are, are being proposed? And uh, is the Board of Health, are we going to be involved in those consultation meetings as well? At this point, the, the there's a community consultation which is really about the people who are close to the three sites. Uh, however, the federal government also requires us to seek input from a wide range of other stakeholders who have a citywide perspective, including the police, the, the local government. Uh, this, we anticipate that this will go to city council, for example, who represent the city as a whole. So there's going to be a combination of citywide input and local neighborhood input. So how would we do the citywide input? Uh, communities outside downtown, like Scarborough, Etobicoke, how are we going to consult with residents in, uh, in those communities? Oh, we're not planning on going directly to those communities, I don't think. Well, how do we consult if we don't go directly to them? Well, City Council represents those communities and many of the other stakeholders, including provincial ministers, uh, the police, uh, will have a citywide perspective. So you're asking the local councillors to have their own consultation meetings in their ward? Is that what you're proposing? No, I think we're looking for something different from people with a citywide perspective. We know that drug users don't travel any great distance, so we're not expecting there to be any community impacts that are not local. So a community which is a long way away, a local community is a long way away from any of these sites should not feel any impact or really have an interest other than broadly speaking in the policy question about how we serve this population and address these health issues. That's true. They won't have a, to uh, they won't have a direct impact, but consultation is consulting with everybody, the whole city. So isn't it important to hear from different parts of the city um, on well, their input as well? Do they not deserve to, um, to give their input? Well, I think consultation as, as, um, to, as laid out in the federal legislation, and that is partly what we're trying to achieve, is really about the local community nearby. Well, if we don't agree to that, we can change that, correct? As, yes, as the, board, the Board of Health can, uh, can direct me to conduct a consultation in whatever ways it seems fit. Uh, there will be, I'm reminded that there will be, for those who aren't participating in focus groups and, and uh, open houses, over, there will be an online uh, survey as well. So we may well get, because online is, is not geographically based, we may well get input from across a wider range of population. But we'd be looking for something different in those consultations, right, because it's not the local impact. Thank you very much, Councillor Nunziata. And the last questions, Councillor Carmichael Gribb. Um, just a quick couple of questions. What's, is there a liability to the city for offering safe injection sites? I think, I think um, all of the city's health services carry uh, some risk and some liability. Um, I think when we've looked at harm reduction services in the past, one of the key questions has been what are the liability of not offering it? If we actually have the ability to intervene and reduce harm, uh, I think we have an obligation to do that. Uh, of course, uh, as with any other service, we, it will, the part that's delivered by the city, which is one of the three sites, uh, will be taking place within the context of the city's liability environment. And is, is there a cost associated from an insurance standpoint or something? Is there an, a cost associated with that? I don't think I can answer that today. I, I can tell you that when we've, um, when we've offered other harm reduction services to injection drug users, it has been within the city's existing sort of liability coverage. Uh, it's something that we could, we could uh, check as a part of developing a new service. And do we have a sort of ballpark figure of what the cost of a safe injection site would be of offering this service? Well, it's early, it's early in the stage of development yet. It, uh, the cost really depends on uh, the cost structure of the three organizations. It'll depend on how many uh, injection stations, how long the hours are that the staff are going to be on duty. So we're at an early stage of design and development. Um, so I wouldn't want to um, give a cost at this stage that's not based on the kind of work that we would normally do. We will have cost information available as we come back to the board. Great, thank you. Any other questions? Okay, to speak, Councillor Cressy as the Chair of the Drug Strategy will go first. And Ashna, you have some time constraints. You do, so you'll go second if, if that's okay, if you want to speak. 
You don't have anything to add? Okay. And then Councillor Doucette. And then anyone else who wants to speak? Okay, Councillor Cressy. Uh, thank you, Chairman Havick. Uh, let me start by thanking all the people who came out to speak today, all the deputants, both for, for your words, but for many of you, your courage. Uh, I'd like to thank in particular the Medical Officer of Health for the strong recommendations that are being brought forward, as well as staff in Toronto Public Health, and I'd like to single out Jan Houston and Susan Shepard for their outstanding work. Um, I chair the City's Toronto Drug Strategy. We talk about substance use in the context of a comprehensive approach, treatment, prevention, harm reduction, and enforcement. It's about saving lives and ensuring people have dignity in their lives. And I want to thank the panel members who are here today, past and present. It's your work that continues to create a more caring city. Uh, preventing overdose, as we've heard today, must be our city's top public health priority. As we just heard, 252 Torontonians lost their lives due to overdose in 2014. It's a painful number, 252 people. In the summer of the gun, a terrible, terrible year, we lost 52 people due to gun violence, and we acted. We lost 252 people <coughs> due to overdose. It's time to act. This is a number that has gone up every year for more than 10 years. It will continue to go up unless we act. And these people who are dying on our streets, they're real people. You've just heard from many of them. They are our brothers and our sisters. They're our cousins. They're kids who go to our schools. They also wear suits on Bay Street. They're people in our city. Supervised injection services are about public health and public safety. These programs will save lives. They'll provide comprehensive health services to people who need it. They'll help move people towards treatment and they'll ensure that people can live in dignity no matter where they are and who they are. These programs will also improve the safety of our local communities. One of these sites is on the border, it's in my community, and it will move drug use and discarded needles out of streets and coffee shops, out of parks and playgrounds, and into a safe and supportive environment. There's no knot in my backyard when it comes to drug use. In fact, it's already in our backyards. The question is, how do we deal with it? That number of 252 people, it's a painful number. These deaths are preventable. In more than 90 sites around the world, more than 90 sites around the world, including two in Vancouver, supervised injection services work. They improve the health of people who use drugs. They, keep, they help to keep them alive long enough so that if they choose and are ready to move off, we're there to help them, and they make our community safety safer. I think it's time for Toronto to act. Somebody said during their deputation that we're a caring city. I think Toronto has always been a caring city. I think we are a caring city. And with a strong voice of support here from the Board of Health, with no changes to the recommendations, not a single one, but simply what is being put forward by our professional staff, we will continue to be a caring city. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Councillor Cressy. Any questions of the speaker, given that he moved the motion? Oh, you're moving, you're moving the recommendations of staff, yes? Okay, Councillor Doucette to speak. Thank you very much. I really don't have much to add to what uh, Councillor Cressy said. He, he uh, touched on all the points. But I just want to point out that as a new councillor last term, um, one of the first things I did was visited the works because I wanted to understand what it does, how it works, and how it helps the community. So when this report came before me, I asked the next question, what is the difference between what the works is doing now and what we are moving forward? And as we heard, for three sites, we will now be adding supervised safe injection sites. To me, that's the most obvious next step. And as some people said, why haven't we done this before? So I do support this, and I also understand that people who use drugs aren't going to travel miles and miles, I'm still in miles, um, to find a safe site. They are using, you are using 
restaurant, bathrooms, I'm not gonna name them. Um, you're using places which are not safe for you, laneways, parks, it's, it's not good. I also believe that if people are taking drugs and they come into a safe site, and as someone's, a couple of people said, there's a friendly face there, they will learn what options they have. They will learn how to do this so they're not putting themselves in danger and they're not putting the community in danger. So I am happy that we are moving forward with this. We also heard today that we need to move forward as quickly as possible. But I do agree with Dr. McEwen, we've got to do our due diligence. We have to get ourselves exempt from some bylaws, some rules and regulations up there. And we want to make sure that we've crossed all our T's and dotted all our I's. We don't want to be back here again redoing this because we didn't quite do it right. So I agree, we need to move this forward as quickly as possible. We don't want to hear about anyone else dying from an overdose when they could have been in a, self, a safe place where there is a nurse to help and to talk. So I want to thank everyone who's been involved with this. I know Councillor Cressy's been working very hard on this as well as his, his staff in his office. Um, all the public health staff, Dr. McEwen. This board does amazing work and sometimes we go out of our safe boxes. We put ourselves out there where maybe there's subjects we don't understand so well because we maybe don't experience those parts of life. But that's what this board is here for, is to make our, our city safe for every single person. And that is what I hope we will be doing today. And I truly hope this is a unanimous vote. And I do support the consultation, but we've got to do this consultation quickly, correctly, efficiently, so we can get this done. But thank you, everybody who's come out today. You've had some very moving stories, and I really appreciate you. Great, thank you very much. Other speakers? Uh, perhaps to, we're just negotiating something here. Um, I'll, I'll just make some, uh, some comments. Um, I think uh, Doris uh, Greenspan from the Registered Nurses Association of Ontario asked a good question, how fast? And I think our perspective, frankly, is as uh, quickly as possible, uh, knowing that we're not in control of uh, all the the timing that there is a federal piece and there's actually also a provincial piece because uh, uh, no doubt uh, the monies for this pilot will come from the province so there are two other parties in this. We're not alone in this uh, but certainly our piece has to be done diligently and uh, as the one of the motions uh, suggests or directs is that the report comes back in July so that we are back here in July with the final recommendation. The other thing uh, in addition to, if you guys could just Take it a little bit over there. Uh, I want to also thank uh, Susan Shepard. You've been a master. Maybe you could just stand up so everyone can see and acknowledge the, the person who's been doing the, the, uh, uh, the drug strategy for this city for, geez, it's got to be 15 uh, years. And she has master, masterfully led this uh, process and made her a better city as a result. Um, I do find it interesting that we did not have a single opponent uh, come out today, uh, and I am, I am so moved by the stories, the, the insights, the analysis that was brought forward to this table uh, uh, today. Um, my hope is, is that recognizing that we're not actually at the decision-making stage. That happens in July. We're at the consultation stage. So at the consultation stage, we're going to move from the advocates and the professional to the, call it political. And the political is about at two levels. One is making sure our councillors are on board, making sure our MPs are on board, MPPs are on board, and making sure that the local communities are on board. And my hope is, is that the spirit of openness and um, thoughtfulness that all of us in this room display today carries forward in those conversations. That is what is going to win the day, I think, for us. Uh, when you hear those stories and you get those analyses before you, it's going to change minds. And, you know, while this room may be united or in the vast majority, that's not the case out there. 
That's not the case out there. So there is homework for each and every one of us in this room to, uh, to undertake, and that is to do have those compassionate conversations that will lead to a compassionate public policy on safe injection uh, services. Uh, lastly, I, I do want to apologize for cutting people off. I felt really bad about that, uh, but uh, just our time constraints uh, did not uh, allow us to, uh, to uh, have longer speaking. So um, that, those, are, those are my comments. Are there any other speakers on this uh, motion? Okay, so uh, we'll call the question. We have the staff report before us. We'll take a recorded vote. All in favor? Raise your hands. All, all those in favor of the recommendations in the report, uh, Trustee uh, Glover, Councillor Carmichael Greb, Ashna Bowery, Stacy Berry, Councillor Doucette, Councillor Mahavik, um, Angela Johnson, Councillor Cressy, um, we have Paul Nagpal, uh, Councillor Nunziata, and uh, Peter Wong. That motion carries. Noting that it carried in, in, in unanimously. Thank you very much, everyone, for all this good work. Mr. Chairman. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, I didn't speak because I wanted to move an amendment, but you reassured me that on what the intent my, of a, my, my amendment was that you were going to try to fulfill the request. Yes, to make sure that the city as a whole is consulted, yes, we will. So you will, okay. I just want that recorded here so everybody could hear you. Okay, okay. great, great. Okay, we have one item on the agenda still to go. Um, people are welcome to hang in, but I have a feeling that people are going to get up and start to leave. The next item is on the funding for methadone maintenance treatment. We have three deputants, but why don't we take a three-minute recess to allow people who need to go to go.